So now it's time to start a discussion about generics. So what are generics? Generics allows us to give to the compiler some hints about what kind of objects we are dealing with. And this uh, helps the compiler to figure out some errors at compile time. And it also helps us to write more uh, consistent and better code. And we already use uh, generics when we look at collections. So every time you use an array and you, you specify in the angle brackets uh, an int or a double or a class that you created an object, uh, what you actually did there is that you use generic. You said to the compiler that that is the kind of data that uh, specific collection is going to store. So if you have something like this val, uh, let's say, uh, numbers and uh, we put equals is equals here and type array of here you can put angle brackets and you can specify a type here let's say in because I'm gonna put numbers here and now this helps the compiler to figure out uh, if uh, let's say we want to add here let's say a string so if I type here numbers equals let's say uh, some text let's put in quotation marks some text as you can see you have those uh, underlines in red which says if you hover over here uh, first it says that val cannot be reassigned so let's change this to var to get the error that I want so let's put var here so we get here type mismatch required int found string so here we are using a generic type and the generic type is an integer and uh, because we said explicitly here that this array is only gonna store integers we cannot go down here and uh, assign um, some string but uh, as I said at the beginning Generics are only a, co a, a compile time feature. They don't make it through the runtime. And again, we're going to come back to this later because this has some implications. Now, let's uh, delete this and let's create our own uh, generic uh, class to see how uh, it works. Because here we're passing int, but if you uh, click on this array of, you see that uh, you don't have here an int. An int is the type that we spe we specifically decided to pass to this array. But if you look here inside this uh, library that kt, and if you go to array here, you see you see that we have var arg elements, and we have this t. And t is a generic type, and the specific type that is going to be passed here is the type that we pass when we create an array when we want to store some numbers or some uh, strings and now now let's see how we can create uh, a similar thing that we have here uh, with our uh, with our own uh, code so i'm gonna delete this so again generics are there to 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 help the compiler to figure out uh, errors and it also uh, they are there f for uh, helping us to write better and consistent code so that you, you don't add, uh, let's say, uh, uh, strings to, to an array which is meant to store only numbers. So, first I'm going to create a class and it's going to be an open class. And it's going to be called player. And it's going to have a property called name. So it's going to be a val name. We're going to define this in the primary constructor and it's going to be a string. Now, I'm going to create open class here and down here I'm going to create two classes first is going to be called uh, football player so football player and this is going to have a name and it's going to be a property because it's going to uh, going to extend from our player uh, class we're going to derive from our player class and going to pass that property to the that parameter name to our property name from the super class so we type here player because we are, we are in, inheriting from it and here we pass name so we pass here name next i'm going to create another class called baseball player so we type here baseball baseball player and uh, this is also going to have a name 
also uh, only a parameter because the property is going to be ultimately defined by the superclass by the class from which we are inheriting from so here we're going to inherit put the colon to inherit from our uh, player player class and here we pass our name parameter that we defined here we pass it here to the primary constructor of the base class from which we are inheriting from all right so now i'm gonna go up here and uh, now i'm gonna create a class called team and this class is gonna represent a team and this thing can be a football team or a baseball team and here we're gonna create a class called team so we type the keyword class i'm gonna call it team and now here we put angle brackets and inside the angle brackets we're gonna define the generic type t and you can use a different letter here if you want but uh, usually and generally uh, use the t because it stands for t, uh, for type parameter next we put parentheses to define the primary constructor and for the primary constructor i'm going to define uh, a val name and this is going to represent the name of the team and it's going to be a string and next i'm going to define also val but this is going to be called players and it's going to be a mutable list of uh, also of type t so we type here mut mutable list and we put here t right now i'm gonna put curly braces because i'm gonna define a function inside our class team so here we type fun and i'm gonna call this function add players so this function is gonna add players to the team we put parentheses and here we define a parameter called called player and it's gonna be of type t so it's gonna be should put a colon here and we put uh, curly braces and this is gonna receive a parameter of type t and this type t that we define here and here and here is gonna be the type the, a specific type that we gonna pass when we create an instance with our uh, class team so first here we're gonna check if the players so our uh, list of players contains this player that is passed to our add player function because if already you are, we already have that uh, player in our list we're not gonna add it to our list so if player and to check if that player is in the list we call the contains function on our on our mutable list so here we we type players that contains player the argument and if that is true we're gonna put curly braces and here we're gonna output something that goes to the console so we type here print line quotation marks and we type player colon and then we put dollar sign curly braces and here we need to do something um, which is called casting and casti casting is used when you want a variable to be treated as a certain type of variable so when you want a variable to be treated by the compiler by the compiler as, as a certain type of object or or, or, or a class so we type here player because let's let let me show you why we need to do that because if I type here player now I want to get the name and if I put here that name as you can see you don't have any name here because because this type because this t and this t that we have here is generic the compiler has no idea if this t that is gonna be passed here so this so if you pass here uh, a baseball player or a football player it has no idea if at, at this moment now if that is gonna have uh, is gonna have uh, a name uh, property on it this is why when we type here that name we don't get nothing and to solve that we can say to the compiler to the, to the compiler to treat this parameter here so this is gonna be a value passed to this parameter as a player and in that uh, sense in that in that way we can get access to the name uh, property so we type here player and to cast to cast uh, a variable to a certain type we put as so we put the keyword as and the type player and we put this in parentheses so we surround our uh, 
expression in parentheses inside the curly braces. And now here at the end of, uh, of, the, of the end of the enclosing parentheses, you put that. And now we have access to name because we said to the, the compiler, hey, three displayer variable. I don't know because I don't know if this is going to be is going to be a, a, a player uh, a player object passed here or a baseball player or a, or a football player treat this player variable that is passed here as because here we have t so we don't know what it is treat this play treat this player variable as a player so you can use the name of a variable and we're going to say is already in the team and we can put here uh, the team and we can type here dollar sign this that name so the name of the team else if if our player is not in the team we put else we're gonna press enter to add the, the right curly brace we're gonna add this player to the list because if the if fails that means that the player is not uh, present in our uh, list so we type here players our uh, multiple list dot add this player that is passed player and it also going to output something to go to the console so you add here print line and uh, I'm going to copy this because I'm ju just going to change the text a little bit so let's delete this player uh, and so here is uh, we're going to say instead of it's already I'm going to say was added in the team. Now let's create some objects with uh, those uh, classes that we have here. So first I'm going to create some uh, uh, some uh, players. So I'm going to create first a football player. So type here val football player equals football player. And uh, for the name I'm going to use a generic name I'm gonna type just football football oh, player one and I'm gonna press ctrl D to create another uh, football prayer so football prayer two is gonna be called and I'm gonna create two baseball players. So we type here val baseball player equals baseball player. And uh, we type here baseball player one. And I'm gonna press control D here also. I'm gonna call this baseball player two. And I'm gonna change this to two. Now I'm going to create an instance of our team class so we we type here val team and this is going to be a team of football players so we type val team equals and here we type uh, team and we put now because as you can see it's expecting a type here and the type is going to be a football player so it's going to be a team with it's going to be a team with uh, football players and here we're gonna define a name, also a generic name, football team is gonna be called. And we also need to pass an array there. And uh, for this array, we're gonna type just uh, mat multiple array of, but I can't. Mut mut uh, list of and here I'm gonna pass our uh, football player I'm gonna pass only our first football player here now I'm gonna, gonna create another team val team uh, let's actually call this first team uh, football team so let's type here football football team now if you run this code
we don't get any output because uh, our add players function wasn't called but if I uh, type here uh, football team actually here football team that add players and I'm gonna add football player too now if I run this code we get football player 2 was actually here should be added football player 2 was added in the team football team so our code works well and we use generic types for uh, our classes here we specified only the t and this t that we have here was replaced with football player that we define here and um, uh, we're gonna do the same thing we're gonna create another team for the baseball player and uh, we're also gonna look at how we can restrict the types that are gonna be passed to our uh, generic type here so now i'm gonna create a baseball team so i'm gonna type here val baseball team put equals then you put here team and here we type for the generic type t baseball uh, player because this is gonna store baseball players and we define a name here the name is gonna be baseball team a generic name and uh, also here we need to type uh, to pass a multiple list so we type multiple list and we pass here a baseball player but as you can see here for the type it, the type here is grayed out that is because because here we pass the football player uh, object that we created and here we pass the baseball player uh, because Kotlin has type inference it can infer the type as being uh, uh, a team of football players so we don't need to put here football player we can delete this we can delete all of this and now our code still works and you can see we have this type hint which says team foot football player so it's a team of football players and it's uh, inferred it's inferred automatically by Kotlin uh, for us and you can do the same thing if here for a baseball player so I'm gonna delete this and as you can see now we also have the hint team baseball player now let's add to the baseball player uh, let's call the baseball player function let's put here a uh, so we type here baseball team let's call the function that add players and here we type baseball player 2 because the first one was added there so now if you run this code not debug so run this code let's increase this we get let's actually decrease this so let's put here we get uh, player football player 2 was added to the team football team so we have this code here which is called and it says that the the uh, football player was added to the team and the name of the football team and then we have player and we have baseball play, player 2 so this this one that we have here that we pass here baseball team that was this to the baseball team as you can see it says player baseball player 2 was added to the baseball team and um, what generics helps us to do because i said they can uh, help the compiler to figure out errors if you try to pass here baseball team that add football player so we type here football player now you get an error because the generic type enforces the type uh, on uh, the the on the class because here we said explicitly that this is because it's, this was inferred to be as a baseball player we cannot pass here a football player in our uh, baseball team because this is enforced because we said here here explicitly explicitly because first because this was inferred from here so we have team baseball player so 
we cannot add here a football player inside our team uh, football player and this is very very powerful for us because in this way we don't uh, do things which uh, doesn't make sense and uh, the same is true about uh, our football team so if in our football team um, so if in a football team, a football uh, team that add and here we put baseball player we get an error because we specified we specified that the, because the generic type was unfair to be a football player so we cannot put a baseball player in our team of football players so this is what uh, generics uh, is doing is figure out uh, those errors for us at compile time and this is very powerful because we cannot uh, we can uh, run our code and we don't get in those uh, some uh, scenarios where we have uh, a ba uh, baseball uh, player added to a baseball team or uh, maybe other examples there so I'm gonna delete this next we're gonna look at upper bounds because upper bounds basically allows us to restrict what kind of type is passed to our generic type here so uh, and uh, particularly gonna see how this is gonna affect this code that we use here to cast so to to add an upper bound so to restrict what kind of type is passed to this type we can put colon so extends and here we can we can type player so what we are saying here is that every type that is going to be passed here when you create an instance like we did here so but be, only that this was unfair here this type that is going to be passed here needs needs to inherit from the player class otherwise this type is not going to work so because of that because uh, the compiler now knows that uh, and enforces this that this type that is going to be passed here is, is going to be is going to inherit from the player uh, class we we, we can't uh, delete this cast because now it, it knows that that type is gonna have uh, is gonna be is gonna inherit from the player class, so it's gonna have the property name. So if I delete this, and if I delete this, so let's put name here. Now, so let's delete this too. Should be player here, player. So now we have player that name because it knows that this type, so this type that is gonna be passed here is gonna inherit from the player class, from the player class. So it's gonna have the property name. So we don't need to do this uh, weird, uh, this uh, word cast, this word casting. So I'm gonna delete this. And now as you can see, we don't have uh, any error. So now we have the name here because now it knows that whatever type you pass here, it has to inherit from the player class so if i go down here and i create another class called gamer uh, player so we type here class let's call it games player and um, it's gonna have a val it's gonna be actually le let's define a parameter only name is gonna be a string and we will not inherit from our uh, player class let's see what happens so if I uh, if I uh, create here uh, another team let's call it val um, let's uh, call it the uh, games team so we're gonna type here team and we're gonna specify here games player now if, if I put uh, now the primary constructor here, here we need to define a name. Let's call it uh, games team and uh, a multiple uh, list of. Now, here we have an error and if you look it says expected player found games player and this happens because 
our games uh, player that we have here is not inheriting from the player class and because we said here that the upper bound is this t that is passed here so this t is this here has to inherit from the player class otherwise if you if, if you if you don't uh, inherit from the player class it will not uh, work because we said here, here that it it must inherit from the player class now if i change this to if i change this down here to inherit from the player class so we type here player we type here name now as you can see the error disappears because now it's respecting the upper bound that we set we set up uh, here which is t meaning games player has to inherit from the player class and then down here it's uh, inheriting so uh, this is our discussion about how we can use uh, generics and how we can use how we can define upper bounds and uh, in the next videos we're gonna look at um, type uh, er erasures and uh, you're gonna look also at uh, reified uh, uh, keyword and uh, how we can inline our function with uh, because you need to inline your function when you use the uh, reified uh, keyword so see you in the next video well actually before i end the video i should say why this uh, generics is, is important why because if you think about be because here we can type uh, we can define a generic type we don't need to create um, a separate class for for every team that uh, that we want to use so we don't need to create a football team we don't need to create a separate uh, baseball team we don't need to create a, a, a se separate games team we, 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 we just create a team we define the generic type t and here we pass our uh, we pass our uh, our type and in this way we can use only one class and uh, we can we can have all of those uh, those uh, uh, baseball team we can have the football team we can have just by having the the type here which is generic otherwise we'll have to create separate classes for each of those uh, uh, teams so see you in the next video and next video as i said we're gonna look at type erasures and the reified um, reified uh, keyword and the inline uh, functions and uh, in the next videos we're gonna look also at covariance and uh, counter variance so see you in the next video so now it's time to start a discussion about covariance and countervariance. And as you can see here, I put it our classes above our main function because in this way you can see if we made the changes to our code. And first, I'm gonna I'm gonna de declare this games player class as open because I want to inherit from it. So we type here open. And uh, down here, I'm gonna create another class called uh, Counter Strike Player. So we type Counter Strike player and it's gonna have a parameter name and it's gonna inherit from the games player and we're gonna pass the name to the primary constructor of the game uh, games player now inside our main function i'm gonna type val i'm gonna create a football team so we type here football team then put equals and now we type team our class and here i'm gonna define not a football player but a generic player so we type here player because i want to illustrate first how uh, covariance works then we put uh, parentheses to call the primary constructor and here, here we need to pass a name so i'm gonna pass the name football team and uh, for the players, I'm gonna type multiple uh, list of, and uh, here I'm gonna put the angle brackets, and I'm gonna type here uh, for the for the type for the type of the function of the multiple multiple list. I'm gonna type football player, and now here I'm gonna declare some players. So I'm gonna type here football player. I'm gonna call it player one again football player 
and this is gonna be called player two. <laughs> Alright, so now we have our uh, football team created, but as you can see we, ha we have this underline and we have an error is, uh, which says that type mismatch required football player found, found player. I think this is a bug because it should say that it uh, requires player and it found f f football player. But uh, anyway, what is saying here is that we said here that uh, this team is gonna have uh, players as its type and here when the we when we create our uh, multiple list we type we type for the type a football player and we pass football players not players so not the type that we define here and uh, now this uh, shows an, uh, an error because this is inconsistent because as i said see here we said player and here we define football player and we pass to the list football players and uh, because T is the same here. We can't we can't do that. Now, if you think about uh, uh, that, uh, what is what we have here, that football player is a subclass of player, then we should be able to accept a football player, even though we declare this player as, uh, even though we declare here uh, uh, the type as a player, we should uh, ac accept a football player. As, it, as the type for the list, for the multiple list, because it's a subclass of, uh, of uh, player. But because the multiple list is invariant, and that means that it will only ac accept the exact type. So if I said here player, then you should define here player, and you should create players objects. You cannot put here football player. And now, um, let, now uh, uh, we're touching on uh, covariance. Covariance means that we can relax. We can relax this uh, type here. We can say, "Hey, I don't need this exact type player to be passed here, and uh, to be created uh, uh, objects with uh, objects players here. I can relax this, and I can accept subclasses of player to be passed to to our multiple list." And to do that, we need to put the out keyword. So we put out before our T inside our uh, type of multiple list on our class T. And now the error disappears because what covariance means is that I'm going to accept the type that is passed here and all the subclasses of uh, the type. So I'm going to accept player or all the classes which inherit from the pair, respectively the baseball player, and in this case the football player that we have here. So this is what covariance is. It allows you to, to, to make this player a little bit more flexi flexible because you, you say, hey, I'm gonna allow to pass here not an, an exact type, respectively player, but I'm gonna allow to pass to our multiple list football players because they are a subclasses of uh, our player class. And we did that by putting here out and we, we made our uh, multiple list covariant. So now it accepts subclasses of player. Now, this is covariance. Let's look at countervariance. And countervariance is the opposite. It's uh, when you want to accept not subtypes of a of a type of a type but super classes of that type so let's see how we can do that so we type here val and i'm gonna call it games team we're gonna put equals then we're gonna type team again and uh, here we're gonna define the type and it's gonna be a counter strike player we define the primary constructor Let's press Control Alt L to format the code, and here we define the name. So it's gonna be called uh, Games Team. Gonna put comma, and here we need to create a multiple list. For the type, I'm gonna choose Games Games Player. And I'm gonna create some uh, games players here. So we type games players. I'm gonna call it player one. And here, I'm gonna create another object. And it's gonna be also a games player. And it's gonna be called 
player one. Now here we have uh, the same scenario, but this is now is uh, the opposite. Now we have uh, we have our uh, type, and here we pass the super type. So the Counter Strike player is inheriting from the games player, and uh, because again our uh, our uh, our T here and our T in our mutable list is is invariant. Actually, now it's covariant, but let's make it uh, invariant. So let's delete this. Now we have also the error here. Now because this this uh, is invariant, it only if you hover over here, it says require require a Counter Strike player and found games player. So we said explicitly here that this this class is gonna have for its type Counter Strike players, and down here for the list we type we pass the game a games player, and then we pass some games player objects. So we cannot have this inconsistency. But again, there is a re relation between the Counter Strike player and the games player, and that is that the Counter Strike player it's inheriting from the games player. So it's a uh, it's a relation between them. So how 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 we can uh, make uh, our Counter Strike uh, player uh, to how, how we can make it to allow a games player here so, so so we can allow games player objects to be created and passed here we can do that by making uh, our uh, our type that is defined here counter variant and to do that we we'll just type here in and that means that i'm gonna accept uh, i'm gonna accept the type that is passed here or all the super types of this class so or or so in other words we're gonna accept all the classes from which we are inheriting this class so we can go even further and pass here player and we'll have no error because because we declared our uh, our uh, list our mutable list as counter variant now we can pass here any super types so this is what covariance and counter variance is covariance allows you to pass uh, to your uh, to your type the type the instance that uh, you want or all the sub sub subclasses of that type counter variance is uh, opposite you you can pass the type or all the super types of that uh, class so with uh, covariance you go down the inheritance tree and with counter variance you can go up the inheritance tree but um, now let's uh, let's change this to games player and let's change this to make it not counter variant but covariant so let's delete this let's put out and now you probably spotted this but you have here players that add we have an error and uh, this is because when you declare your uh, your type as covariant you cannot use the you cannot use the the the, the list to add or to, to remove items from uh, from itself that, and that is because if uh, because we, we made our uh, type counter variance that means you can pass any of the subclasses so you can get in a scenario where you can add uh, here because it's, it's uh, because our type is covariant so it accepts any sub subclasses we can have a subclass like uh, we can have a baseball player extending from a football player and we can uh, add a baseball player here so you will have a team of uh, football players with a baseball player in it so this is why it uh, doesn't allow to 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 add players to to it, to, to the list with this we have here uh, this in red so this is the the limitation which comes with making the type covariant so this is our discussion about covariance and countervariance. So you can play with this code. You can change now this to in. Let's pass your games player. And as you can see, if I because I made that uh, countervariant, now this uh, error disappears here because it accepts the the super types. It accepts the sup the the classes from which we, uh, we are inheriting th uh, this type. And if you make this out. Now we have the error here because this is not uh, countervariant, but this is covariant, so it accepts the 
the subclasses of player. And uh, in real app, probably, probably you're not gonna write code like this, but I type this code in this way to show you how covariance and countervariance works. So this is our discussion about covariance and countervariance and uh, see you in the next video. So now it's time to start a discussion about type erasure and reified keyword. And as I said at the beginning of our section about generics, generics are only a compile time feature. They don't make it through the run time. So if you have a list of integers, when the code is going to be compiled and run on the JVM, the JVM is only going to see a list. It's not going to see a list of integers. So they are, they are only a compile time feature. They help us and the compiler to figure out the errors before we run our code. So, and, and also they help us to write consistent code. So we don't, uh, if you declare a list of uh, strings, so you want to store uh, text in that list, uh, uh, you, it helps you to write consistent code because in, in the sense that if you try to add to that list uh, an integer later, it will warn you, it will say you that you declare a list of, st of strings and uh, you try to add uh, a number to it. So they, they are, they are uh, syntactical elements which help us to write better and consistent code, but they don't make it to the runtime. So the JVM is not going to see a list of integers or a list of uh, players or a list of uh, what or, or a list of, uh, of any object, generally speaking. And that has some implications. And one implication is that you cannot do type checking with uh, with uh, generics. So if I delete this code, and if I declare here a list, let's call it list, and I'm gonna type multiple list of, and let's type here string, and here I'm gonna put some words. Hello. Let's put world. So, because they are uh, a compile time feature, if you try to do checking, so if, if you try to see if a list is a list of strings, so if I type here if list is list of string. So if I try to check for this, actually now this works because if you look here, it says rem rem remove useless is check. This is because the compiler figure out from by looking at uh, what value we assign to to our list that is a list of string and is always always going to have only string. So pro probably when this code is executed, uh, the the if is not even uh, uh, it's not it's not even uh, generated. This way is saying that this is uh, useless because it figured out that it, this is gonna store uh, only strings. But if I change this here to any, so I put here any. So let's type list again. So now because this is any, so it can store uh, later. Let's say. Uh, uh, an integer. Now it says cannot check for instance of erase type list of string as I said because the generics don't make it through the runtime so it's it's impossible to to, to check for this thing because this thing is not uh, does not exist uh, for the JVM. But if I want to check for a list so if I delete this so I, if I want to check if it's, if it's only a list I can't uh, let it like this because Kotlin wa wants us, f enforces this behavior to specify s the type. And if I want to check if uh, this list is a list, I need to put, uh, if I click on this red, bul red bulb, it says add angle brackets and we have this star. And this basically means check if this, uh, check to see if this list is a list. This is what it's doing here. Now, Let's create a function to see how uh, we can use a uh, reified keyword with uh, the, and, and having and having this in mind that the type the generics are erased at, uh, at compile time. So I'm going to create a function, but first I'm going to delete this. 
and we go down here we type fun and to create a generic function we put the keyword fun then angle brackets and we put t this is the syntax and this function is going to return a specific type of elements from a mixed list so it's going to be called get specific types it's going to take a parameter called list it's going to be of type list of going to be of type list of any and it's going to have a return type also a list and it's going to return a list of t so type here list t put curly braces and press enter now here we're going to create a new list so we type val new list or uh, let's call it uh, specific specific list let's call it and this is going to be a mutable list of uh, type t then we're going to loop through our list so type for element in our list so list parameter is passed put uh, curly braces we'll go down and here we're gonna check you if element is of type t so if it's that specific type that we gonna replace when we're gonna call function then we're gonna add that specific to type to the specific to the list called specific uh, list so we type here if element is t then i'm gonna put curly braces and i'm gonna add that element to our specific list so specific list that add element so if that element is of that specific type that we you know, passed uh, when we call this function then it's gonna be added to the list and when this loop gonna end gonna return this list so return return specific list but as you can see here we have an error and if you hover over t it says cannot check for instance of your type t because as i said types are only a compile time feature they don't make it to runtime so it's impossible for uh, for our to, to make this uh, check it's impossible to check if uh, an element is of a specific type because on the jvm uh, generics don't uh, don't make it to the, to the jvm they don't exist they are erased at compile time so we cannot uh, check here for t so if i wanted here let's say i have here a val mixed list and it's gonna be equals to a mutable list of and uh, it's gonna have let's say some numbers and uh, some characters a b a b and uh, C and two words let's say let's type here hello and world now if I called our function so let's call here let's type here val specific specific list so it's going to have the same name as the variable from our uh, specific types function equals to get specific types now here when we pass the type let's say uh, uh, int and here we pass the mixed list So now, because here we want, because we passed for the type int, so this now this t was is replaced to, with the int. When we try to check to see if this element is an int, we can because this is erased. But Kotlin has the the, the notion of reified of reification, and that means to not if you use the reification this type is not going to be erased at compile time so it's going to make it to the runtime 
and to use the reify so to make to in other words to make sure that this is not erased and to make possible to check for uh, this uh, t in this case to check for integers we need to mark our t here as reified reified t and if you have a rover now it says that add inline modifier because reified works only with inline function so we need to put the keyword inline on front of our uh, function and now our t is, as you can see the underline disappear because now our t is uh, now our t makes it to the runtime it's not erased because we made our function inline and we marked the type as reified so this is what reification does it makes it makes sure that the types are not erased at compile time so now if i add a loop here so let's say data type 4 element in specific list I add, print, I add a print line here, element. Now if you run this code, now you'll see our specific elements from our mixed list output in the console. So you're gonna see our integers because here you pass for the type int. So let's wait a little bit. I think we have an error. So yes, this uh, has to be so let's comment this line of code because that is an error so re let's run our uh, code again so let's run our code again let's bring this up so now we get we get our numbers from our uh, mixed list so we get let's bring this code a little bit up So we get one, two, and uh, 360 because we, we specify here int, and here we, we checked for int because now the type wasn't erased. And now you can change this. You can change this to char. And now it's gonna output the letters from our list. So we get A, B, C. So we get our specific types chars from our mixed list here because we specify here char, and here we're checking to see if this uh, element is of type char, then we add that element to the list. Then we return that element, we return the data list at the, when our loop finishes. Then we call our function here with the mixed list, we pass the mixed list, we get the elements, and then we loop here through the, through the specific elements that we got. So this is our discussion about inline and reified keyword. See you in the next video. So now it's time to see how we can define more than one upper bound to our type because here we have only one upper bound and that is whatever t, whatever type we're gonna pass here it has to inherit from our class player but we can define more than one up upper bound and to do that I'm gonna delete this uh, upper bound from our t there and I'm gonna go down here I'm gonna declare an interface which is gonna be called listener and it's going to have a function called listen. So fun listen. And now I'm going to go inside our, uh, let's say, uh, football player. And here we're going to implement that interface. So I'm going to put here comma and listener. This is how we can uh, also inherit and implement an interface. So we type listener and you put curly braces and now we have to implement uh, that function inside our class so implement the listen function and we delete this now to now we have this uh, underline here here in red which it says uh, our reserve reference name that's because it, it cannot know if this t is gonna have a, a property called name so it cannot know if we're gonna pass uh, uh, type here which is going to have a property name so this is why we have now here we talked about this in uh, our previous videos now to set up two upper bounds we go at the end of our uh, primary constructor and we type where so we type the keyword where and here and here we put where t 
T or T inherits player. So this is the first upper bound. So our, our T, whatever T we pass to our uh, to our team uh, class, it has to inherit from our player and also, so we put comma, it has our T, so we put also T, it has to implement the interface listener. So these are the two upper bounds which has to be satisfied in order for our T to be valid. Otherwise, we're going to show an warning. And now here we have an error and says type arguments is not within its bounds. So we have bounds, not bound now because it, it, the compiler knows that we have two bounds. And this says expected listener found Counter-Strike player. So it knows that uh, the first condition is satisfied because Counter-Strike player extends from uh, from player but does not implement the interface player but if i change this to let's say let's say that i change this to football player so if i type here football player now we don't have an error because both uh, upper bounds are satisfied our football player in inherits from the player class and it also implements the listener the the listener interface so this is our discussion about upper bounds and you can use two upper bounds with uh, functions also in the same way you define the two upper bounds at the end of uh, the at the end of the parentheses of the function one more thing to know here is that you can define a single upper bound not in this way only by defining the upper bound uh, in the header of the class but you can define only one single upper bound also using the work here so if i delete this uh, t uh, extends listener and i let here where t player as you can see we don't have uh, any error here so it knows that this t that is going to be passed here and uh, here uh, here is a special case because this uh, is counter variant it has to inherit from the player class so you can define your uh, upper bound or your upper bounds using the where or you can define one upper bound here by putting a comma and uh, you type uh, player so this is the same thing as having this yeah so if i delete this so you can have it like this if you want, if you want to, to have one upper bound or you can have it uh, like this. So or you can define the only only one single upper bound like this. It's up to you how we do it. So let's change this back to listener. Actually to T extends the listener. So this is our discussion about multiple upper bounds. This is how you can define for your type more than one upper bound. But uh, before I end our video, let me show you how you can define uh, two upper bounds for a function. And for that, I'm going to go down here. I'm going to create a function called, and here you need to put first the fun keyword, angle brackets, we put T. So this is how we define a generic function. I'm going to call it add player. And uh, I was going to have a parameter called player is going to be of type also t now to define two upper bounds to our to for this function we type at the end of our enclosing um, parentheses we type where so we type where so where t where t inherits from player this is the first condition and t implements listener so we put t listener and then you put curly braces. So this function is going to take as an argument a type, that, but that type has to inherit from player and it has to implement the listening interface. And if I call this function here, add player, and let's say that I pass here a Counter-Strike player, I need to pass an instance here, an object, so put parentheses, type player1. Now we get uh, an warning here, an underline. So this says require listener found counter strike player. So the compiler correctly figure out that uh, uh, it, our counter strike player class inherits from the player. So it satisfies the first upper bound, but it does not implement the interface listener. So 
it does not implement the listener inter in interface. But if I pass here football player, and we pass also an instance, so we put parentheses to call the constructor to create the object, and we put here uh, a name, let's call it player1. Now, we don't have any error because football player both inherits from the player class, so it satisfies the first condition, and it also implements the listener interface, so it satisfies the second uh, upper bound. So both out upper bounds are satisfied and we don't have any warning. So this is how we can define two upper bounds for functions, and this is how we can define two upper bounds for uh, classes. So see you in the next video. So now it's time to start a discussion about access modifiers. And as the name implies, access modifiers are used when you want to specify how other people are going to access your code or how other parts of the code can access your code. And there are four access modifiers in Kotlin, and those are the internal, the public, private, and protected. And I'm going to look at all of those in this video. But first, let's type the main function here because we don't have the main function main.kt. And I deleted the main function because I wanted to show you a shortcut of, for typing the main function. So if you just type main, you have a suggestion which says main, and if you press enter, it's going to add the main function for you. So if I press enter, now I have the main function here. Now, let's first uh, look at the public keyword. And uh, the public keyword is used when you want to allow all the other parts of the code to access, uh, to be able to access your code. And all the functions and classes that we looked at are by default public. So if you go in, inside our uh, classes uh, file, and let's say that I declare here a function called, uh, let's call it fun, get data, and it's not going to do anything. I'm just going to add the print line here. getting the data. Now, this by default is public and that means that you can access this from another part of the code or from uh, another, you can access this actually from another file because we, we actually did that. So if I type here because they are implicitly public, you see that is grayed out the keyword public because it says that it's redundant. So it's by default it's public. Now if I go here, now I can call that function here, but in order to use that function here, I need to import that code. So let's type here import, and I'm going to type uh, com, I'm going to type the name of the package where that code is, example, dot classes. And I'm going to put dot and asterisk to get access to all the code, not, not only to specific parts of the code. Now if I type here get data, now I have a series suggested get data from the com that example that classes package. So this one so because it's public. Now I can access that function from a different file from the main file, even though it's declared inside the classes file. So we get getting the data. So our code works. Now let's uh, bring this down. Now let's look at the private uh, private access modifier, and uh, the way we declared our uh, our function here is called declaring at the top level and declaring something at the top level means that it's it, when your code is declared aside outside of a class or an interface that means that that code is at the top level so uh, if you see so if you see this thing called top level this is what it means now if i make this private private means that this function is going to be accessed is going to we're going to allow this function to be only be used inside the same file. So if you try to use this in a different file, you, you will not have access to this uh, to this function. So if I go now in main.kt, now I have an underline and if I hover over, it says cannot access get data. It is private in file. So basically, in other words, what it's saying is, hey, you declare that private, and that means that it's only uh, accessible in in the classes file. I I, I cannot uh, I cannot use that here. So if I call it here, let's say in one of our functions. So if I type, let's say here, get data. 
here I can use it because it's private and that means that it's it's gonna be be is gonna be accessible only inside the the same file. So we're gonna, we're gonna be able to use it inside the same file, but outside this file, in another file like the main file, we can't use it because it's private. So this is what private uh, and and public. Uh, are uh, in as, as access modifiers with functions and we can also have classes which are private and uh, we're not going to look at uh, public classes because our, our, all of our classes are by default uh, public if you put the if you type the public keyword is going to be uh, gray out and it's going to say that's redundant but if i make let's say that i make this football uh, actually let's make the the team class private to see what happens if i make this Actually, let's first call it here to see. So let's call it here Val Football. Football. Football team equals team of football players. And it's going to have a constructor. First is going to be the name, going to be a football, uh, call football team and going to create some football players because now our list is, uh, actually our list is uh, counter variant and I'm going to type here uh, football player, actually let's type mutable list of and I'm going to type here football player, player one, football player, player two. So now this code can be used as in our previous videos in this uh, in this file because you've imported this uh, code here and uh, because it's public by default, all the classes and function are public. But if I make this private, so if I type the private access modifier in front of our class, if I go now inside the main uh, function, we have the same uh, error now, if you hover over the underline of the team, which says cannot, uh, cannot access team, it is private in file. So because it's private, it can, only, it can only be accessed inside the same file. It, it, it cannot be accessed outside the, the, the file which on which is defined. So this is the public and uh, uh, private with, uh, you, you, with the code at the top level, but um, you're gonna look at the next uh, access modifiers and we're going to look also at those access modifiers and we're going to look at them inside the declare them declare them on properties so this is what we're going to do next because uh, what we did now is only looking we only looked at the top level but before we look at access modifiers inside our classes respectively before we look at access modifiers um, on our uh, properties let's first look at another access modifiers at the top level and that is the internal access modifier so i'm going to go inside our uh, classes and I'm, I'm gonna change now the class uh, team from private so so in other words being uh, accessible only inside the, the file in which is declared to internal to see what happens so if I change now to this to internal now if I go here now we don't have an uh, underline and that is because the internal keyword is used when you want to make um, a class or a function to be accessible only within the same model, module and you may be wondering you know, what is a model. A module is basically a group of files uh, which are compiled together so if you go on the left hand side here and if you look at this OOP this is a module and in Kotlin you can have multiple modules and um, the internal keyword means that this is only going to be uh, accessible in the only within the same uh, module and because uh, the the main uh, package is in the same module then you can uh, use it inside the, you can use that code inside here but if it were to have uh, another module and if you you create two modules this is this will not be you'll not be able to use the, this class in the in the second module so this is how you can use the internal modifiers and next you're going to look at how you can use uh, 
those uh, access modifiers uh, and the protected protected as mo access modifier and i didn't use the access modifier protected here because the access modifier protected can only be used inside classes on property so if i type here protect protected i don't have uh, any suggestion and you see that it's blue so it's recognized as secure but i cannot use it on classes so it says modify a protect is not applicable inside the file. so you cannot declare the protected uh, keyword the, the protected access modifier at the top level so you, ca you can only use it inside the classes and this is what we're going to look at next i'm going to create a class and going to look at uh, all of those access modifiers now uh, and we're going to look how it's going to how the we're going to look at them on properties and how it's going to affect uh, the properties which have those access modifiers now let's look at access modifiers inside our classes on properties so i'm going to delete this code now because i don't need this code i'm also going to delete the import because it's gray out because you don't use uh, any of the code from that package so i'm going to delete this and i'm going to go down here and i'm going to create a class called user and i'm going to define the the properties inside the class not inside the constructor so i'm going to type first uh, var first name it's going to be a string and we need to assign a value we cannot let this uninitialize so i'm going to put an empty string var last name also a string i'm going to assign also an empty string let's first uh, look at the public access modifiers and by default all the properties which are declared are uh, are uh, are public so if you type here public you'll have the same uh, thing like with the, like at the top level so it's going to be redundant because by default all uh, all properties are by are, are by default public so if you put here public now it's the, the public keyword is gray out because it's redundant so if you hover over it says that redundant visibility modifier so i'm gonna delete this so this is about public they are all by default public so you don't need to declare them they're not really public because you as you so you access them only all, always through the getters and setters now let's look at the private so let's uh, let's let's actually create here an user var user equals user and i'm gonna type here uh, user dot first name equals alex and user dot last name equals dobin now, if I make one of the properties private, that means that I cannot access the, this property outside of the class. So if I put here private, now I have an underline which says cannot access first name. It is private in user. And this is because now by making this private, we're not allowing, uh, not allowing anybody to, be, to, uh, to access this uh, property outside of this class. So we can only use it inside the class. So if I have a function, he'll call the update name let's say and uh, let's go let's type here new name it's gonna be a string now here i can type uh, first name equals and you get the idea but uh, i cannot use it outside the class so i cannot use that outside the class because it's private so if i do the same thing here if i type private this is also now unaccessible. We cannot access it outside. But uh, if you think about uh, about the, our discussion about the getters and setters, the getters and setters have the same visibility as the properties. So because now we made the property private, the setter is also private. So we cannot uh, change its value because this is calling the setter here. So um, and. Um, Let's look at the next access modifier and that is the internal. And internal uh, means the same thing that is going to be uh, accessible only within the same model. So if I type here internal, now I can use it outside the uh, outside of the class. So I can type user that first name equals to Alex. So this is in this is internal. Now, let's look at protected. And protected Protected uh, makes sense if you think about subclassing, if you think about inheritance. So 
with protected you cannot access uh, this uh, outside of the, of the class but you can access uh, inside of a class from which you are inheriting or on which you are inheriting so if i put here protetic now this is uh, not being you cannot uh, access this outside because uh, so if i type protected it's also uh, it's also underlined but if i create here new user let's say uh, class uh, i don't know uh, vip user and if i uh, if I put here, uh, let's inherit now from our user class. Now it's saying that uh, to make, yeah, you, know, you need to make this open, I forgot. So let's make it open. Now I can access the first name and last name inside our VIP user. So if I type here fun, let's call it uh, print info and if I type here print line and if I type inside the print line first name as you can see you can use it inside the class inside the VIP user class because we are inheriting from the user class and uh, Protetix allows us to use uh, its properties inside our uh, VIP user class if I type here first name I can use it if I type last name I can use it but uh, if you make this, uh, let's look now uh, at, at uh, inheritance with access modifier. So if I type here private and uh, I type here uh, first name, not that. So I type here first name, I can't because it's private, so it cannot be accessed. So this is our discussion about access modifiers. This is how you can use the different access modifiers on at the top level on function and classes and this is how you can use them on properties to allow or to, or to restrict uh, uh, the access uh, on your code so let's type it protected so see you in the next video so now it's time to start a discussion about packages and imports and for that i'm going to open the project pane and to open the project pane you just go on the left hand side here up and uh, if you hover over, you, there is a shortcut to open the project pane on Windows is Alt uh, plus one and uh, on uh, you, you'll see the corresponding shortcut on your uh, system. So, or you can press on this project. So if you press, the project pane is going to be open. But before you open that, let's uh, explain why you'll need to use packages and what are packages. But let's start with the second one. So. Packages basically are some folders in which you can put your related code because the the, the way we, we we type our code here is not the way in which you'll type our code in a real app because you have the classes and the interface and you have everything in the same file. In a real app you will have your code organized better and uh, you have your code uh, separated in each uh, package so you have your classes in a separate package you have interfaces in a separate package and if you have a database you'll have that and that also in a separate package because in this way you better organize your code and you know where the stuff is and um, now to create a package you just just open the project pane right click on Kotlin and you go to new then you go down here it says package and now you need to give a name to our project to our package the usual name is com dot example and then uh, the name of the package uh, that you want specifically so let's say that i want to put classes here so i'm going to call this com dot example classes now this package with this name com dot example dot classes was, was created and uh, you can you can take all of our classes now and instead of declaring them inside the inside our main.kt, we can create a new file here. Kotlin class file. I'm gonna call it classes also. Press enter. And we can see now you, we are inside this package com that example that classes. Now I'm gonna press control V to paste this. And now we have our classes inside here but now our classes are inside this folder this package com.example.classes that we created and uh, 
Now we can delete this from here, but now we will have some uh, errors because we don't have uh, because now we don't have the classes defined inside our uh, main.kt file, and we have this uh, this uh, red because it, it cannot uh, the the classes are not declared, so it cannot uh, it cannot use them. Now what you need to do is that you need to import the classes from from our uh, from our uh, new package and let's create uh, another package for uh, for the main file for the main.kt file so let's right click let's create a new package and let's call it uh, com that example that main so here we're gonna put our main uh, .kt file so uh, let's put it here click on refactor and now our main has uh, the main.kt file and uh, our uh, classes package has cl the classes.kt file now we still have an error here and let's create another uh, package let's call this package uh, com.example.interfaces so we, we, we now when you say, when you say it, com that example that interfaces you are inside the package com that example so this classes pack, package is a package inside the package com that example this main package is a package inside com that example that main you can uh, create them separately so you can think of uh, other way of organizing this but this uh, is the standard way of uh, creating packages so come that example that interfaces this is going to be called and then we're going to put our interface so i'm going to right click create a new kotlin uh, file it's going to be a file and it's going to be called interfaces and here we're going to put our interfaces so we're going to take our interface from here Control c and paste it inside this package now we can delete this but now we have all those errors because uh, the compiler uh, can't uh, find where the, all of those uh, packages are and now as you can see we have this package com that example that main because now our main.kt file is inside com that example that main uh, package so this is why you have here com that example that main now we have those those uh, we have the class team in red the player the football player all the classes all the code that we had previously now is in red this is because the compiler cannot find them declared so in order to 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 have them uh, in order to be able to use uh, the team class the player class and all the classes that we declare also the interface we need to we need to import them and to import uh, something means as the names implied to bring that code inside our uh, inside our own uh, package so now because uh, the classes are inside the classes package you need to import those classes inside our um, inside our main um, main package and to do that just uh, you can hover over here and the compiler is going to help you to import that and okay you can click on this uh, right button and click import and now you can see it says import com that example that classes or you you can uh, type yourself this and that code is going to be imported now you need to import also the player class and uh, as you can see so, so if you hover over here it says com that example that classes that player so it found it found the the the, pack, the the package where this player class lives so let's also click on the right bulb but it doesn't appear and uh, we can type here just import and we type com where, where that class is that example that classes that player so now you have imported our player class and now the error disappeared but uh, you can do this for for all the classes but there is a there is a, there is a shorter way to do this but let's type first uh, import now com that example that classes and let's uh, import the football player let's type again import 
So now you're, you're bringing that code to be able to be, uh, you, uh, now you bring that code to be able to be used inside this class. So import, now I'm gonna import the Counter-Strike player, which is also in the com that example that classes package. So if I Counter-Strike player, we're gonna import also the games player and we get the idea. Com that example, that classes, that games player and now now our code uh, looks similar to what we had previously just that we imported now all all of this code from a separate package so from a, from a separate from a separate uh, package and uh, you can uh, click on this uh, sign and this is gonna uh, uh, do this to your import so you can keep plus so we have this in the expanded form so or you can increase decrease this now uh, we have now we have the same code that we had previously the only thing is that now we imported all of that code and we didn't define all of that code again to be able to use. just imported that code by using the import here and the package where that specific uh, uh, class is uh, is de is defined but if you look at this there is a lot of code just to if you want if you have uh, 100 uh, classes what you're gonna do you, you're gonna type import for all of them and there is a shorter way to write this by using the asterisk sign so you can delete this and you can put at the end of the classes so you can put here that and you put asterisk and that what this means is bring me all the code inside this classes package so inside this classes go inside this classes package and bring me all the bring me all the code let me use all that code so now as you can see we have the same uh, the same uh, uh, error as previously because by putting the asterisk here now all of that code this was uh, imported for us we didn't need to type let's press ctrl z all of this we can just delete this and put and put here uh, an asterisk sign that asterisk sign and that is going to bring all of our code so uh, this is how we can use packages and imports in your code and uh, see you in the next video also i should say that packages also help other developers to see where uh, our code uh, by organizing better our code they can see where our code is so if you click on this uh, arrow in front of our main and in front of our interface in front of our classes and if you look at this code for the first time, you know, here are the classes, here are the interfaces, here is the main function. So visually you can very easily determine where, uh, where the developer who created, let's say, this program put it, uh, the code. So this is also help, helpful for other developers and it also increases code reusability because you can see just by putting the asterisk sign at the end of the package uh, from which you want to import, you can get all of that infrastructure or the, all of that code inside our uh, inside our own package and can work, can use that, uh, can use that in our code. So this is how, uh, this is why you need to use packages and uh, imports. So uh, if you want to get all the code from, an, from a specific uh, package, just type the name of the package, that, and you put asterisk and you will have uh, access to all of that code just by typing one line of code. So this is our discussion about packages. This is why you need to use them. They help you to better organize your code for you and for other developers. And they also increase code reusability because you can, you can import a lot of uh, uh, the code you can import a lot of uh, can import big uh, chunks of code inside your own code just by typing uh, a line of code so uh, see you in the next video so now it's time to start a discussion about exceptions but first i'm going to create a new project i'm going to call it exceptions for the language select kotlin for the build system intellij make sure to have the jdk selected and i'm going to check this little box to have the main uh, function auto generated for us so i'm going to click on create now to create our project and I'm gonna delete the, this code inside the main function because we don't need this code and uh, I'm, I am also gonna hide the project pane now what are exceptions? exceptions are errors which happen during the execution of your code for example let's say that I have two variables one is gonna be called a and it's gonna have the value 5 
and the second one is going to be called b and it's going to have the value 0. Now if you try to divide the 5 by 0 you'll get an exception because you cannot divide by 0. So if I add here a print line and I type here a divided by b now if you run this code we'll get an uh, we'll get an error we'll get an exception which is going to say that this uh, which is exception in thread main java the language arithmetic exception divided by 0 so you cannot divide by 0 another uh, exception another error could, could be let's say that you try to get an element from an array at an index that doesn't exist so if i delete this code and I declare an array, an array called numbers, and I call here array of, and I pass here only a number, and let's say that uh, down here I add a print line, and here I type numbers, square brackets, one. Now, if we try to run this code, you'll get an error because we have no element at the index 1, the, the index 1 is not even existing. So we get exception in thread main java that, that length array index out of bound exception, index 1 out of bounds for length 1. So it's saying that this index is, doesn't exist, we have no element at this index. Now, what we can do instead of letting the exception to be thrown and uh, have our app crushed, we, we can uh, we can surround our uh, code which can potentially throw an exception with a try and catch block. So what we can do is, uh, let's say that I press Ctrl Z to have the code that we had previously. And what I can do here, I can say try, so try to execute this code. So try to execute this code, divide by zero. And if something happens, then catch that error, not, not, not uh, so we put here E from exception and we put what kind of, F of exception is going to be catch, catched by our uh, try and catch block. So we put here uh, arithmetic exception. And we need to put, uh, we need to put curly braces and we add here a print line. And we're gonna call e e dot. So let's put actually something more uh, specific. The let's say you can't divide by zero. And here you can put uh, dollar sign e dot message. And this, this, this is the extension that we catch. So if I run this code now, because I surrounded our uh, our uh, code, which can uh, which will uh, throw the error. Now we get we get the message. You can divide by zero. We can divide by zero, and we get uh, divide by zero. So you now we get this instead of crashing our uh, app. And uh, this can be particularly good if you know that a code could throw an error but not, it's not, you're not sure so you surround your uh, your potential code which can uh, throw which can uh, uh, where, where that error can happen and you can say try and if that happens then catch that and show a message or do something with that uh, with that uh, with that thing now the problem with this try and catch is that if you have some code here let's say if i had a print line here which is doing something let's say uh, divide by zero and now if you run this code you'll see something uh, interesting you get you can divide by zero and you don't get this print line because when the exception is thrown so when this this line of code is executed the try the try uh, the try and catch block is going directly to the catch and the code which comes below of our uh, code which uh, is where the error error happens it's not executed so if you have something important below here to i don't know maybe you have you have you you need to 
close a database or something, that code is not going to be executed. So this is not good. What we can do is we can add a finally block. And finally block is used when when uh, you want to add when you want to execute some code, no matter what, if the no matter of the if the exception happens or if the exception does not happen. So if I put this now in the finally block, and this can be some code which you want to uh, have uh, executed, no matter if the exception is thrown or not. So now if you run this code, you get you can divide by zero, so you get our. Uh, catch because it's throwing uh, the exception we have the error we can divide by zero and then we get divide by zero so we, now we get our code executed because the final block is going to be executed no matter what no matter if the exception is uh, thrown or not so if i put here uh, five let's say and if i run this code now we have uh, we have one because this is uh, because we have 5 divided by 5 and we have divided by 0 so the finally is always executed no matter if the exception is thrown or not and um, let's close this and let's change this back to 0 so to have the error and you can use the try and catch block also as an as an expression so let's see how we can do that now to use try and catch as an expression we just define here a variable called result and we're gonna assign our try and catch to our variable result and the last line of code in the try or in the catch is gonna be assigned to our variable result so here I'm gonna put a divided by b and here I'm gonna put 0 so these are the values that are gonna be returned by our, by, to, by our try and catch to our variable result and down here I'm gonna output in the console that value so I'm gonna print I'm gonna add print line here and I'm gonna type result now if you run this code you get you can divide by zero so our catch is called and uh, get uh, this uh, divide by zero from the DC that message then we get our code uh, which is called from the final block because the, the code from the final block is called no matter what irrespective of uh, what has happened irrespective if the exception is thrown or not and then we get zero because our catch catch block is called and the neck the the last line of code in the in the curly braces in the block of code of the catch is, is assigned to our variable result similarly to the way we assigned uh, we use if uh, if then as an expression but if I change this to 5 now if I run this now this is gonna be assigned to our variable result because that is the last line of code and we get in the output 1 because uh, now the exception now the, the code inside the try is executed and it outputs 1 then we get divided by zero because the finally, as I said, is called irrespective of what happens if the try, uh, if the exception is thrown or not. Then this a divided by b is assigned to all variable result, and we get one again. So this is how you can use try and catch as an expression, and this is how you can use try and catch to try and uh, catch uh, exceptions in your uh, code. So see you in the next video. Now it's time to start a discussion about lambda expressions and higher order functions. But first I'm going to create a new project. I'm going to call it lambdas. I'm going to select Kotlin for the language, build system IntelliJ, make sure to have the JDK selected. And also I'm going to check this box to have the main function generated. Now let's delete the code inside the main function because we don't need this code. Let's hide the project pane. Now, what are higher order function? If a function can accept function as parameters, that is called the higher order function. If a function can return a function, that is also called the higher order function. If a function can do both, that is also called the higher order function. Now, what are lambdas? Lambdas are just f functions without no name. And we're going to look at some examples with those. But first, let's create a function called add in the traditional way. So we're going to type here fun add is going to have two parameters int so it's going to be they're going to be of type integer and it's going to have a body 
and just gonna output in the console the sum of a plus b. So I'm gonna type here quotation marks and I'm gonna put a plus b equals dollar sign curly braces a plus b. So this is gonna return. This is gonna output in the console the, the sum of a plus b. So if I call this function here add, and if I pass here two numbers five and ten. Now if I run this, we'll get fifteen. So we'll get a plus b equals fifty. So this is how we're doing in the old way. Now let's see, let's see, let's see how we can achieve the same thing using a lambda function. So what I will do first is that I will, uh, I will first show you how to assign a lambda function to a variable. So I'm gonna type here val. I'm gonna call it my lambda. Now to declare a lambda function, we just put curly braces. Then you put, then we need to type the parameters. I'm going to explain this uh, immediately. So we put here a, I'm going to put, it's going to be an integer, b. So th those are the parameters of our lambda function. Now I'm going to put dash and arrow, so the greater sign. And now I'm going to define the body of this function. So what comes on the right of the arrow is the body of this function. So we type print line. And we're going to put here a. Let's actually put quotation marks a plus b equals dollar sign put curly braces a plus b. Now what we did here is we define a lambda function. So what is inside those curly braces lambda function. Those are the parameters of the lambda functions, similar to what we have here. So what we have here is what we have here. Those are the parameters and this is the body. This is the body of this function. So what we have here on the right of this greater, uh, on, this, on, the, on the right of this arrow is what we have inside here. So this is the body of this lambda function that we have here. So what, it, what we do is just print, we're gonna output on the console the, the the sum of a plus b. Now I can call this lambda function now in my code. So if I type here, uh, let's say uh, my lambda. Now we put parentheses, and here we need to, as you can see, we have int and in. So I need to pass some parameters. So I'm going to type here also five and ten. So let, let's actually put a different numbers. So let's put eight and nine. Now if you run this code. Now we get a plus b equals 17 and this we got this using our lambda function so we do we do we did this not using our add function that we have here but with our lambda function and again those are the parameters a and b like we have here and on the right on the right hand side of this arrow we have the body so we have this so we have the body of this lambda function and we assign this lambda function to our variable my lambda and we call that inside our code here and it outputted uh, 8 plus 9 is 17. So this is using a lambda function. And if you hover over this my lambda function, it says that val my lambda and here you have the data type, what kind of type this function is. And uh, we're going to talk about this uh, immediately. Now if you hover over my lambda, it says that you have a val my lambda and you have colon int int and then you have the arrow sign and you have this uh, unit. So what is the meaning of this? So this is the type of this uh, lambda function. So this is what the compiler inferred to be the type of this uh, of this uh, my lambda function assigned to my lambda variable. So here we have my lambda and it takes two parameters of type int and on the right here of this arrow it says unit and this means that this function is not returning anything. So it's returning nothing. This is what this uh, is the meaning of this. So similar to the way you have a variable here called text. 
and it's gonna be of type string. And we're gonna sign the text here. So similar to the way this variable has a type of, and the type is string, the, in the same way this uh, this lambda function also has a type and the type is two is those ints here and the, the and it has also this greater it has this this arrow and unit so it's saying here that the, this function is going to take two integers and it's going to return nothing so this is the type so lambda functions have type and the type you if, for a lambda function can be inferred as you can see here we didn't declare here uh, we didn't put here colon int int and then dash greater sign unit so we didn't type this explicitly here because in the same way that this variable string can be inferred so if you hover over here it says that remove explicit type specification in the same way this lambda function can also be inferred to be of type int int and it's gonna return unit because the compiler can figure out that but there are scenarios where we need to specify uh, the type of a lambda function and we're gonna look at those now let's say that this other function that we have here is gonna take as one of its parameters a lambda function and to do that we first need to define here that this is gonna take a lambda function and to do that we type here uh, lambda let's say or we can choose another name, let's call it action. And we need, here we need to specify the type because now it can't infer the type, it can't figure out what type is because don't have here an expression, don't assign here uh, the actual function like we did here. And here it inferred the type because it's look on the, on the right and it's, it's so that this is of type int and int and it's gonna return nothing. Here we need to specify the type. So I'm gonna specify here, let's say, uh, this is gonna be it's gonna be an integer and it's also gonna return nothing. So we put here dash greater than sign and the type unit. So what to say here that this is gonna be a lambda function, it's gonna take as a parameter one integer and it's gonna return nothing. This is what we're saying here. And down here we're gonna call that, so we're gonna type action. Now we, put, we need to put uh, parentheses the same way we, and you see now it's expecting an int. So we type here a plus b, right? Now, if I delete this, let's say that I delete, let's say that I delete all of this code. Now, if I type here add, now I need to pass two numbers, let's say that I pass uh, 5 and 10 and now we need to define here the lambda function and we can define it uh, uh, like we have it previously by typing val my lambda and to put equal put uh, curly braces and here we're going to define a, a parameter it's going to be of type int and then we put what is going to be the body of this lambda function so we put dash greater than sign and the body is going to be just to output uh, whatever that parameter is B is going to be a in the console so we type here a now we can assign that lambda function here to this uh, to this uh, parameter my lambda so type my lambda so we assign to our parameter action my lambda function that we created here and we assign to this variable so now if I run this code We get 15 so this is correct we get 15 and we did that by assigning uh, my lambda function to my lambda to, to my action uh, parameter that is defining and this is going to be a lambda function but what you can do with lambda functions is that, you, that if the last parameter in the function or in the in the header of the class in the in the constructor of the class is the is a lambda function you can declare the lambda function outside but first let's see how you can put it here so what you can do because this is an expression we can delete this and we can take this press ctrl c and we can paste space here directly this so now if i run this 
because this is an expression now this is gonna be assigned to this auction my lambda and it's gonna output output 15 and we did this like uh, this is similar to object that uh, when you look at anonymous classes because this now is also anonymous in the sense that we don't have here a name so we don't assign this to, to anything we just define it here so it's an expression so you get also 15 so now if i close this what you can also do if the last parameter in the function is uh, a lambda is a lambda is a lambda function and uh, or if the last parameter in a, in a in a constructor is also a lambda function you can put the lambda outside the parentheses of that uh, function or of that uh, uh, class so what you can do here is i can delete those and i can put here parentheses and now I can press enter. And this is going to work fine. So let's actually put it on the same line. So now as you can see, the lambda is outside the parentheses. It's not defined inside the parentheses that like we did. Because if the lambda is the last parameter in a function or in, a, in the constructor of a class, it can be defined outside of that uh, outside of the parentheses so if it's the last parameter so if i run this now you'll get the same output we get 15. so let's close this now let's see how we can change the code that we had when we talked about object expression with lambda functions so i'm gonna delete this code and now i'm gonna speed up now the things a little bit because we're gonna add that code that we had previously in a previous video so I'm going to type class, button. So this is the code that we had in the video when we talked about object expressions. Now I'm going to create here uh, the two buttons, val, login, uh, button. It's going to be a button, it's going to have the login text, the ID is going to be a random number. And here we need to type the onclick listener, and here I'm going to type object. And we're going to, going to, in, going to implement our onclick listener. So we need to click on this, click on this red bulb, implement members, and implement onclick. Now let's copy this, let's paste it here, and I'm gonna call this sign up. Now let's also change the ID. Now what we have here is that we have an object expression, we have anonymous, uh, anonymous uh, classes, and uh, by using the object keyword and let's press control alt format the code and we implement that on click function on this specific uh, button or for the login button and for the sign up button but to do that we use the object keyword we implemented that from the interface to so override the interface here and there is a shorter way to achieve the same thing using lambda function because if, because a lambda functions and uh, the code that we have here respectively our uh, object expressions because object expressions and lambda functions are both expressions so they can be assigned to, to a variable we can define here a lambda function instead of the one click listener interface and we can uh, we can pass a, a lambda function to our object which is going to be created with this class or to our object which are going to be created with this class so i can delete the code that we have here so i can delete this Here also, I'm gonna delete this code. Now, what I can do is I can change this from a one-click listener to call. It, to, to, let's call it. A, let's also call it one-click listener, but it's gonna be a lambda function. So let's define a lambda function, and here I'm gonna put parentheses because this is not gonna take any parameters. Our one-click function is doesn't have any parameters then we put dash arrow and gonna return 
unit. That means that this function is going to return anything. So I'm going to delete this. Now, because our lambda function, our lambda function is the last parameter inside the header of the class, we can define it outside. We can define it outside the we can define it outside the parenthesis. So I can put it here. So I can put here curly braces and that's all. We have our lambda function there and I can put here also. But if you hover over, we have this underline. So it says move lambda function argument out of parenthesis. So let's click on this and let's click on this also. So now here we can add the code to log in the user if this button is clicked. So let's put a comment here. Login user and uh, sign up the user. So these are now we achieve the same thing that we had previously. Respectively, we have a particular uh, behavior when one, when one button is clicked, when the login button is clicked, it's gonna execute the, the code inside this lambda function, and when this when this button is gonna be clicked, it's gonna execute this code inside the lambda function and we did this now using the lambda function and not using the interface and the object keyword and implementing that we did, we did it by declaring our last parameter as a lambda function now let's actually look at android studio to see how android studio suggests us to change our code that we had for our buttons the one click uh, listener that we had to change our code from a object expression to a lambda function. So if I open Android Studio, as you can see, we have uh, an underline here. And if you hover over, if you click on this uh, yellow bar, it's convert to lambda. So we can change that to a lambda. So now this this was changed to a lambda function. And let's, if you hover over this, it's also saying the same thing. So convert this to a lambda. So let's convert it to lambda, but let's put the code on one line. So now we have uh, all the same code well, that now we have the lambda. So this is the last parameter inside this function set on click listener because it's out, it can be put outside the outside the parenthesis. So this is our discussion about lambda functions and see you in the next video. Now it's time to look at the it identifier inside the lambda function and it is the implicit name of a single parameter inside the lambda function. So let's look at an example with this. So I'm going to create a function here. It's going to be called uppercase, so it's going to uppercase the letters of a certain parameter. So we define here the parameter, it's going to be of, called str, it's going to be of type string. And here I'm going to define a lambda function, I'm going to call it my function, my fun. Function. And now, here we're going to define the type of this lambda function, and it's going to take one parameter of type string. Then we put dash greater than sign and it's going to return a string, it's going to return the string uppercase. So you put curly braces and press enter. And here we type val upper, uh, let's call it uppercase word. Put equals and it's going to be equal to my function, so my lambda function. Now we put parenthesis and we pass our str. And this is going to return the, the text uppercase. Let's actually hover over here. All right, so let's add the print line here. And we, do, we type here uppercase word. Now, here we're going to call our function uppercase. We define a, a word, let's say hello, with lowercase letters. Then we define our lambda function. So we put curly braces. We type uh, the parameter. So let's uh, type here, uh, let's say, uh, and here we define the parameter for our lambda function. So we define, let's call it S. It's going to be of type string. And we're going to type here dash greater than sign. And here we're going to type S dot uppercase. So this is our lambda function. Now if you run this code, you're going to see our uh, text uppercase.
so we get hello uppercase in the console and uh, if you look here if you hover over because you have an underline say lambda arguments to be move out of parentheses so this is the first thing that this can be moved out of parentheses because the last parameter inside the higher order function and now we can use the when we have only one single parameter in your lambda function instead of using the uh, instead of defining the parameter here and uh, and uh, then uh, also you can delete the dash arrow so you can delete the dash arrow and here instead of putting s we can put it so it that uppercase and now i can delete this arrow delete the string and let's let's the door it so now this it is the it's like having our s but this it is the implicit name for a single uh, par for a single uh, parameter inside the lambda function so now if you run this code now you'll have the same output just that now it's more concise and we have only this it identifier so we get also hello so this is how you can use the it identifier with lambda function see you in the next video now it's time to start a discussion about scope functions. So what are scope functions? Scope functions are functions which can be called on almost any object inside your code. And what those scope functions are basically doing is the same. They execute a block of code on an object. What's different is how this object becomes available inside the block and what is the result of the whole expression. The scope functions do not introduce any new technical capabilities, but they, they can make your code more concise and readable, as you'll see by looking at some examples. And because scope functions are very similar, choosing the right one can be a little bit tricky. And uh, the question which arises is how you can distinguish between them. There are two main differences between scope functions. First is how you can refer how you how you how you how you refer the context object and that is the object on which the scope function is called and you can refer the context object either by using the this keyword or the it identifier so this is the first difference the second difference is the return value because uh, the scope function can return a, a, a value and uh, the return value can be either the context object and the context object is the object on which the scope function is called or the lambda result and we'll, we'll see what uh, all of this is in, uh, in this video and first i'm going to create a main function because uh, i deleted the main function here and to create the main function just type m and uh, intellij is going to give me some suggestion you can choose main the first one or you can choose main a and that is going to be the main function with the args uh, and the array of strings so i'm going to choose the first one and uh, i'm going to create a, a class down here it's going to be called uh, user and uh, i'm going to define the i'm not going to define the properties inside the primary constructor i'm going to define the properties inside the class so I'm going to type here var first name and I'm going to assign some default values. I'm going to put equals, I'm going to be an empty string, var last name, also an empty string, and var age, I'm going to put minus one. Now, here I'm going to create an user, so I'm going to type val user, I'm going to put equals user, we need to call the primary constructor, but we don't have any properties because the properties are defined inside the class. And now, if you want to define, uh, if you want to define values to, to our properties, first name, last name, and age for our user object that we create, we need to type user, that first name, we did this in a, in a previous video, equals Alex user that last name equals Dobinka and user that age equals 23 and this is fine but what we have here is uh, code repetition because we have user that first name user that last name user that age and imagine if you have hundreds of uh, properties you'll have to type user and user again and again and with uh, a scope function specifically with the with scope function we can make this we can reduce the we can reduce this rep code repetition by uh, by using the with scope function and the with scope function 
you can refer the context object uh, on the width scope function using this and the uh, result the return value of the scope of the width scope function is the lambda result but let's look uh, how we can use so actually let's put that code back to see to see exactly so if i type here width And here we need to pass the object on which you want to operate. I'm gonna go type, I'm gonna pass the our user object, and the next parameter is the lambda function. So we put curly braces and press enter. Now, because the with scope function, as I said, they are used, scope functions are used to make our code more concise and readable. Now we can avoid typing user that first name, user that last name, and so on. And we can just type here this because this is how you can uh, you can access the user uh, object inside this lambda function inside this scope function with this that first name equals Alex. This that uh, last name. equals to Binka and this that age equals 23 let's press ctrl alt l to format the code and now we have uh, the same thing but now we're using the this keyword and we didn't use uh, the user again and again and uh, because uh, Kotlin is about conciseness. We can also remove the this keyword because it will be uh, generated under the cover. So we can delete this. Also here, also here. And as you can see now, we don't have, don't need to use uh, user that first name, user last name. We can just type the first name, last name, and age, and you can assign the the specific values to the properties. And uh, now I can delete this because I don't need this. Let's press Control Z. Let's bring this up a little bit. Now let's look at the return value of this score function. And as I said that the return value of this score function is the lambda result. So this score function can return something. So the lambda result means that this score function will return whatever is the last line of code. So if the last line of code is an integer, and if I type here val result now if i hover over the result to see what type it is you see that result is of type of, in of integer because this is the last line of code and the last line of code is going to be the the value which is going to be returned if i put here a text let's say that i put here text the lambda result so the value which is returned is going to be a string so we have a string so this is what lambda result means and the value that is going to be returned uh, specifically with with the width score function is going to be the last line of code and uh, you can also return the object and to return the object because you can uh, refer the object using this we can type here this and now the what is going to be returned is going to be the user object so if i hover over here now i have user so uh, this is what the lambda result is the last line of code is going to be returned now next we're going to look uh, and now you see how this makes our code more concise and uh, uh, more readable and uh, next we're going to look at the next uh, score function which is uh, the apply score function so uh, let's delete the with score function and let's look at the apply score function and uh, the apply score function, uh, you can refer the context uh, object also using the this keyword. And uh, the return value of the apply score function is the context object. So the object uh, on which the score function is called is gonna is gonna be the uh, the object which is gonna be returned by the apply score function. And we can call the score, fi score function by, you can call it on uh, on an object. We can, it's not like the with score function which can receive uh, the object. So we can, we, we type here that apply, because we're gonna look at the apply. And here you can type this, that first name. So similar to the with uh, score function, Alex, 
uh, this dot uh, last name equals Dobinka and this dot age equals 23. So this is similar to with uh, the, with the with uh, score function, but uh, the difference is that it, it cannot receive um, uh, it cannot receive a parameter. You you need to call it on an object. So you call it on the user object that we created here, and we can also remove the this because this will be generated under the covers. And uh, now the difference is that the return value. So if I delete this just to show you. The return value is this whole expression. So this and this entire object is going to be return is going to be the return value. So if I put here 23, let's say I have uh, this and he said this expression is unused because this is not going to be returned. So uh, to show this more clearly, let's uh, type here uh, val user. So let's put equals. Let's press Ctrl Alt L to format the code. And now if I hover over here, you can see that this is a val of user. And if I type here 23, let's say this is still a user because the the return value is the context object and that means that the return value is the object that is created here so the entire object so this is how you can use the apply function so to 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 provide some values to the properties and now down here you can uh, use the with uh, score function to print those values in the console so, so you can type user instead of typing user uh, that uh, first name and last name and age you can type here print line and you can type first name. Let's press Ctrl D two times, and you can put here last name and uh, age. Now, if you run this code, we get Alex Dobinka and twenty three. And now you can see here clearly how score functions can make our uh, make our code more concise and readable. And uh, you, with the apply function, we define uh, some uh, values to our properties. With the width, we output them in the console without uh, using that user that that first name and and uh, uh, doing that repeatedly. The next score function and uh, again the return. I'm gonna repeat this. The return value of the apply score function is the context object. So it's the object on which the apply fun fun uh, function is called. So it's the object that is created here. So the user object is returned. So it's in contrast with the width score function, which uh, which returned the lambda result. So whatever uh, was the line, the last line of code. Um, so this is uh, the difference between the two. And also the, the fact that uh, the width score function receives the the object on which uh, you, you want we, it wants to perform the operation here we, we call on the object uh, the apply function so um, that but the main difference is the what they uh, they they return so this returns the context object the object on which is called so and this returns the lambda result and uh, next we're going to look at the also score function and the also score function is used when we want to do some additional operation on an object after you instantiate it or after you created that object so i'm going to look at that uh, next so now let's look at the also score function and for that i'm going to move uh, the properties that are defined inside the class inside the primary constructor so i'm going to delete those and i'm going to define them inside the primary constructor you'll see immediately why so i'm going to type val first name of type string val last name of type string and val age of type int now I'm going to delete the with score function because uh, we don't need this and I'm also going to delete the apply score function because we don't need this now the also score function is used when you want to perform an extra operation after you initialize an object. So uh, let's first initialize our object. So let's pass some values to the property of the primary constructor. So I'm going to type here Alex Dobinka 
and uh, 23 let's first control alt l to format the code now let's delete the curly braces because we don't need those curly braces and uh, i'm gonna declare this class as a data class because i want to have the two string uh, function auto generated to have the string representation of the class now if i want to print the value of the properties of this class because now it's a data class i can just type here print line and i can type here user and now you fill on this code we get user first name alex last name dobinka age 23 so we get the string representation of the object but but in order to get the string representation of our user class we had to first initialize the object then we store that into a variable and then we use the print line to output that uh, in the console and with uh, also you can do this in a more concise way so you can delete this we can also delete uh, the variable on which the ob user object is created and i can type at the end of of our object uh, which is which was initialized that and we type also so we type also and we press enter or we just type you can type also yourself and you put uh, the lambda function now here what i can do because here uh, we, now also the uh, scope function you can refer the context object so you can refer the object on which the lambda function is called using the it identifier so what we can do here is you can type print line and we can put here it and it is the user object which was uh, was instantiated now if you run this code we get user first name alex last name dominica age 23 and this is uh, using the also also score function and this is more uh, readable and uh, concise and uh, we did that by using the also function now what is the return value of this also function the return value of this um, also function is the context object so if i type here val result and if i put equals if i hover over the result you can see the type is a user so the the uh, what the return value of the what the of the also function is uh, the object itself so it's the object on which the also function is called so the entire this entire expression is going to be returned ins inside our variable so this is uh, the also function and uh, again we can delete this because this looks more beautiful and concise next we're gonna look at the let score function so let's close this so let's look at the let score function and for that i'm gonna delete this code because i don't need this code and uh, you, we generally use the let's go function to avoid null pointer exception so let's declare here a variable let's call it uh, text and it's going to be a nullable variable so you put the exclamation mark here and we assign null to it now if uh, we try to output this uh, variable in the console we get a null pointer exception because we assign null to it so it has no value and so the compiler doesn't know what to do with that but with a let score function we can avoid that we can print that and uh, we type text so the object on which you want to call the function and we put that and we type let and we press enter and within the lambda now to refer the context object to, uh, then to refer the object on which uh, the function is called the, the score function is called we use the it identifier so we type here print line print line it so print the value of the text you're saying here in other words but this will, st will still throw a null, null pointer exception if i run this so if i run this we get uh, null and let's close this and um, to, to avoid this we need to use the let score function along with the safe call operator so we need to put at the end of our uh, variable we put question mark dot let and then so what we're saying here let let execute this uh, block of code only if this value this variable the value of this variable is not null now if i run this 
we uh, don't get nothing because this is not now executed because uh, we said here execute this uh, this code the print uh, the code inside the curly braces the code inside the lambda only if it's not null and because it's null it's not executed anything but if uh, we assign down here something to our text let's put here uh, equals uh, name let's declare it as a var now if i run this now we get name because it uh, executed the code inside the, the, the scope function of uh, the lambda. So we executed this code and uh, the code is to output the value in the console. So we get name. And generally this is how you're gonna use uh, the let function. You're gonna use along with the save call operator on uh, variables which are nullable. But it can be used in other cases too. And uh, now next we're gonna look at the next uh, scope function and that is the run scope function. But before we do that, let's uh, talk about what is the return value of this uh, scope function. And the return value of this scope function is the lambda result. And that means that whatever is the, li the last line of code, so if, if, it, it, if it is an, in an integer, if it is a string uh, yeah, or a char, that is going to be the value which is going to be returned. So if I put here, uh, let's say, uh, text, not like that. So if I put here uh, text, now if I put here val result equals, now this is gonna be a string, a nullable thing. So this is how, uh, this is what uh, the lambda result is, whatever uh, is the last line of code. This, if we, as I said, if it is an integer or, or, a, or a string, that is gonna be returned by the, by the scope function. So, now let's look at the run function. Now let's look at the run scope function. For that I'm gonna delete this code because you don't need this code. And I'm gonna create an user, val user, but it's gonna be a nullable user and I'm gonna assign null to it. So I'm gonna type user, user, nullable equals null. Now, the run uh, scope function is a, a combination of with and let function. So uh, let's type the with, uh, with function here, scope function. So let's type user and uh, let's type print line, first name, let's press control D. Let's change the last name and to age. But now we have a problem and that the problem is that this can be null and we assign actually null to it. But because this is a this is a nullable now user object, we cannot uh, we cannot output this in the, in the console because we have another line which says that only safe call. So we need to use the safe call or the not null assertion. And uh, the only way to to get around this and to, to get the values, to get the properties outputted in this way in the console is to use a run function, a run scope function. And to use a run scope function, you just type user, we put the safe call operator dot, and you type run. And inside the run, you can, you can reference the object, the context object using this. But because uh, we looked already at this, this is, read, is uh, can be omitted, you can type directly here. You can type here print line, first name, let's press control D, and now we don't have that uh, underline that we have here. So print line, last name, and uh, print line, age. So this is what uh, the round function is. It's a combination of let and uh, with and um, the return value is the lambda result so whatever you type here so if you type uh, an integer and if you type here val result then if you hover over here this is going to be an integer a nullable integer so whatever you type at the end of the 
uh, uh, as whatever we type as the last line of code that is going to be the type that is going to be that is going to be returned by the score function so this is what uh, the run score function is doing is it's a combination of uh, both width and let and uh, this is how you can use it so this is our discussion about score functions and uh, see you in the next video now it's time to start a discussion about threads, but first I'm gonna create a new project. And now the window for creating a new project looks a little bit different because the JetBrains, the makers of IntelliJ and the makers of Kotlin have released a new version of IntelliJ. And now the window looks like this and uh, personally I found this uh, more uh, intuitive. And here you select a name, I'm gonna call it, uh, here we give a name, threads. And for the language, select Kotlin. For the build system, select IntelliJ. For the JDK, make sure to have the JDK there. And uh, I'm gonna check this add sample code, and that is gonna generate the main function and the and the main.kt file for us. So click on create. Now our project is gonna be created. And I'm gonna delete this code because I don't need this code. And also I'm gonna hide the project pane because I don't need the project pane. So now, what are threads? Threads are a unit of execution within a process, and every program that you create has at least one thread, and that thread is called the main thread. And the process is also called an application, this is your program. And our code is executed on that main thread. And uh, now you may be wondering why you you will need more than one thread. That is because our code is executed line by line. So the, if you, you have a line of code which has which is read, it has to read that line of code to finish whatever that line of code is doing. So if it do, is doing some hard uh, operation like getting some data from a database, it it uh, it will uh, do that and it will not execute the next line of code until it finishes this line of code to get that data. And uh, if because our code is executed, let's say we just want the main thread, that it will, it will block the execution of the rest of the code. And by creating another thread, we can put that hard work on another thread and the, the, we, can leave, we can leave the rest of the code to be executed normally. One way to think uh, about thread is like having uh, one road and on this road uh, there are cars which are moving and if one of the car stops all the cars on the road uh, road uh, uh, are gonna be uh, stopped and uh, creating another thread is equivalent to creating another road to put that uh, car on that that uh, road and you know you don't block the traffic for all the cars so this is how, how uh, you sh you can think about uh, threads. And let's say that I have here to show you hello world multiple times to see this. So I'm, I'm gonna press Control D a few times here. And I'm gonna put hello world one. Now if you run this code, you'll see in the output hello world one, two, three, four, and so on. So we get hello one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and we get 11. Now, uh, this code is executed on the main thread and uh, we can get access to the main thread by typing thread. So let's say that I put, I type here thread because we can put the thread to sleep. I, and this sleep is gonna uh, mimic, let's say, the getting some data from a database. So we can put the main thread, the, the thread on which this code is executed, on sleep for a few seconds. So we put thread that sleep, and here we need to pass as an argument uh, the milliseconds. So let's put five thousand milliseconds. F uh, th that means uh, five seconds. So if you run this, our code is going to be executed. With, until uh, hello world 5 then it will pause for 5 seconds and after that is going to execute the next line of code so you look here we have 5 then it stays it passes 5 seconds and then it uh, outputs uh, hello world 5 6 7 9 9 10 and 11 so this here could be 
getting some data from a database and if that, that takes a lot of time it will block your uh, execution of your code and we don't want that. Now to avoid this we can execute this uh, hard uh, work which is no, now we just uh, type thread that sleep but let's imagine that you have a function which does something or get some data from the database let's say. You can create another thread to put this working to be do done on that thread and we don't block this uh, main thread and this main thread is going to execute this code that we have here. So to create a thread let's uh, go here we just type the we just type thread and we select this which, ha which has that block of code and inside here we, we put our code which you want to be executed. So this code is now is going to be executed not on the main thread, but on our second thread that we created there. So now, as you'll, as you'll see, our code is not going to be blocked by uh, this uh, thing thread asleep. As you can see now it, uh, now it, uh, it uh, outputs the code without uh, that posing. And to show that this actually works, I'm going to put here a print line which is going to say, let's type here print line, thread 2 has finished. So now if you run this, now our code is executed normally on the main thread. And after 5 seconds we get thread 2 has finished. So we get in a way our code executed in parallel. So we, we can do more than one thing at the same uh, at the same time. So this is how uh, you can use a thread to do some work uh, on the background. And uh, there are there is more to more to talk about threads, but I'm not gonna do that because uh, there is something else that we can use in Kotlin to do this uh, work on the background and uh, or this work in parallel, and that is called coroutines. So see you in the next video. What are coroutines? Firstly, in order to understand coroutines, you need to understand how your application works when the user launches the application. So, by default, when you launch an application, a default thread is created, the main thread. And this is the thread on which all the operations are performed. And the operations are performed in a linear fashion, line by line. What that means is that the next line of code has to wait for the previous line of code to finish execution. And those operations are small operations like UI interaction, mathematical operations, small logical operations. So on the main thread we perform small operations. Now, what about the long and heavy operations? Such as the ones which require the use of internet, like upload or download a file, loading or displaying an image, or running some heavy database queries. Well, if you run these heavy operations, because the code is executed in a linear fashion, the next line of code will have to wait until this heavy operation is done. And that will block the main thread. So the main thread will be not be able to do anything else while it's performing that heavy operation. And this will appear to the user like the application has freezed. And if the main thread remains blocked for a longer time, the app will crash. Therefore, running those heavy operations on the main thread is not recommended. To solve this situation, we have a solution. Instead of using the main thread to perform those long operations, we can create background threads to perform those long operations. We can create a thread to perform network operations, we can create another background thread to download the file, and we can create a background thread to perform, a da to perform database queries. By doing this, now the main thread will become free for the other small operations. Those background threads seem to be like a solution, but there is a limit of how many background threads you can create, because the device will run out of memory if you create too many and the application will crash again. Therefore, creating many background threads is not a solution. So what is the next solution? And here comes into action coroutines. So when we use coroutines we don't have to create so many background threads for each operation. Instead we can just have one background thread on which we can launch a coroutine. 
So you can launch a coroutine to perform the long heavy operations like uploading a file. You can launch another coroutine on the same background thread to do some network operations. And similarly, you can uh, launch another coroutine to download the file. And you can have more coroutines to perform other long and heavy operations. With just one thread, we can perform so many heavy operations. So, this is what coroutines are. They are like threads in the sense that they can run in parallel, they can wait for uh, each other and communicate with each other, but, but they work within a thread. They are not threads. And you can create thousands of, of coroutines without any memory problem. Now, how to use coroutines? To use coroutines, you need to first create a Kotlin project. So I'm going to open IntelliJ ID. Click on create new project. I'm going to call it Kotlin coroutines. For the language, select Kotlin. And for the build system, now select Gradle. And after I selected Gradle, this option down here, Gradle DCL appeared. From here, select Kotlin and then click on Create. Now our project is going to be created. And uh, also you should make sure that you have internet connection in order to be able to have the project uh, created. Once the project is created, just go on the left hand side of the project pane and double click on build.gradle because here we're going to integrate uh, our coroutines and we we'll go inside here where it says dependencies and here we're going to integrate our coroutines and here we need to paste this statement, this one. So I'm going to copy this and this is going to integrate coroutines in our project and I'm going to paste it here. Now. This on the top, this icon now appears here. So if you click on, if you hover over, it says load gradle changes. And this is gonna integrate uh, the coroutines and it's gonna apply the changes. So I'm gonna click on this uh, icon. Just wait a little bit. All right, now our project is ready and now we can use coroutines. But first I'm gonna create a file. So click on SRC, click on main, right? Click on Kotlin, go to new and select Kotlin class file, select file and I'm going to call it main and press enter. And now we have our file and now I'm going to start a discussion about coroutines. Now I'm going to close the build.grade file because you don't need this file and also I'm going to hide the project pane and I'm going to add the main function. So I'm going to press M, press enter and by default the main function and, and the code within the main function is executed on the main thread. So let's add a comment here, execute on the main thread. So let's add the print line here, which is going to say uh, main program starts. Let's put colon, dollar sign, and we're going to type thread, that current thread. So this is going to give us the current thread on which this uh, statement is executed, that name. So it's going to give us the, the name of the current thread on which this code is executed. And now we're going to pretend that we're going to do some uh, work in, in, uh, in the background, but we're going to do this work also on the main thread. So I'm going to, instead of, because we, we don't do actually that work, we're just going to pretend. So we're going to type thread, we're going to put the thread to sleep to, for a few seconds. So we're going to type thread that sleep 2000. So this, I'm going to add a comment here, pretending to do some pretending here to do to do some work. So here we're going to pretend that we're doing, doing some work in the background. And then I'm going to add here a print line, which is going to say main program ends also colon, dollar sign, and thread, that current thread, that name. So all the code that we have here, this code is going to be executed on the main thread. And because here we, we type thread that sleep for 2000 milliseconds, so we're pretending that, that we're doing some work for 2000 milliseconds. This, now when this line of code is going to be executed, the thread is going to, is going to pause and then it's going to execute the next line of code. So if you run this code now, Oh, 
we get main program starts and we get main then we have that uh, delay of 2000 milliseconds for of two seconds then we get main program ends and uh, we did this on the main thread so as you can see this, uh, this thread that current that name it's returning here main because the work is done on the main thread but as you can see this is not uh, the way we'll do things because this blocks the main thread for 2000 milliseconds and imagine if you have here uh, a function which performs a heavy operation it will it will block the thread like we, i explained in the introduction video what we can do is creating a background thread and we're gonna put that thread that sleep so that uh, work that we're pretending to do into that thread so i'm gonna type here thread so we're gonna type thread lambda expression press enter and we're gonna put this code now i'm gonna put this code inside here but I'm going to add a new two of you print lines. So I'm going to add here print line and I'm going to type fake work starts colon dollar sign thread that current thread that name. So that is going to give us the thread on which this uh, back. So this is going to give us uh, the thread on which this background thread is on which this code is executed. And uh, I'm going to add also print line here. After we finish the work, we type fake work finished. Also colon. I'm going to type thread, that current thread, that name. So what we're doing now is we we uh, creating a background thread. And now we, we're uh, executing that uh, work that uh, that we imagine on this background thread so that we don't block the main thread the, the main execution on the main thread and this code now is going to be executed without waiting for uh, that work to be finished because now that work is done on the background thread so now if i run this as you can see we get main program starts main program ends so this line is a, of code is executed then this background thread uh, is uh, launch and uh, then the execution of the, of the code continues so it, this code now do, doesn't block the main thread and it says main program ends and then in, we get fake work starts and we get thread does zero so this is the thread on which this background work is executed and then we get uh, so get fake work starts I get the name of the thread from this that we have here thread uh, that zero and then then we get, then we get fake work finish and the code on the main thread and the code on the background thread it's executed in parallel so in other words it's executed concurrently and that means that the code is executed in parallel so the the code on on the main thread is not waiting for the code on the background thread to finish no it just it's just uh, executes this line of code it sees here that there is a background thread and then it uh, goes to the next line of code and it's executed this line of code so it's not waiting for the background uh, it's not waiting not waiting to the for, for this to finish in order to be able to execute this line of code so this is why we get here main program start main main program ends main and then we get fake work starts our background thread and then we get fake work finish and now if you run this again you will see the same uh, output so get main program starts main program ends so those two are executing in parallel with those two that we have here and this is because we're using uh, a background thread now let's see how we can achieve the same thing using a coroutine so instead of thread i'm gonna delete here what we have here and, and i'm gonna type here coroutine scope now but before we create our first coroutine i want you to notice something which is very important so i'm gonna change this back to thread Now I'm going to run this code again and we get main program starts, main program ends, we get main main, then we get fake work starts, thread, fake work finish, thread. So we get our code executed in parallel concurrently and what I wanted to notice is that even though this last statement was executed in our uh, main function, our program didn't end there. The program waited for the, for the background thread to finish the work and then we get process finished with exit code zero so th then the application finishes so by default 
the application will wait for the background thread or for the background threads to finish their work and only after that it will uh, it will uh, finish the application it will terminate so let's now change this back to coroutine scope so we type here coroutine scope i'm going to explain immediately what is a coroutine scope and now the coroutine scope is expecting here as a parameter co a coroutine context but first let's uh, talk about what is a coroutine scope so a coroutine scope is usually used when you want to group a bunch of coroutines together so if you want to have a bunch of coroutines to be grouped together because uh, maybe one one coroutine depends on another coroutines on another coroutine and uh, if maybe one of the coroutine fails you, you can cancel all of them you can do that because because if, if you use them if they are in the same uh, coroutine scope so this is what uh, coroutine scope is, is uh, used for it's used to to group a bunch of coroutines together so you can do you, you can have flexibility you can do you can do you can do things if uh, some, something happens with one of the coroutines now this coroutine context here here you need to pass here you need to pass uh, on what here you need to pass first what kind of work we're gonna do so this is what we're doing with the coroutine constant we're saying to the coroutine scope what kind of work we're going to do and on which thread we want to do that work so we have a few options first is the main so if i type main now let's press alt enter and we have this main that coordinate is coroutines main means that this coroutine scope is gonna is gonna work on the main thread but this main that we have here only works on uh, and on an android program but now we have only intellij so we cannot use main the next one is io and io means input output and this is used for um, getting data from uh, the internet or the querying, querying a database so this is when you should use uh, io and uh, you also have default default means doing heavy work so if i put here default so you see that you have dispatchers that default you can press enter and basically what this means is that this coroutine scope is gonna do some heavy work and it's gonna use um it's gonna it's, it depends on the coroutine what kind of uh, thread it's gonna choose from the thread pool next you still have this error here because we need to launch the coroutine we need to create the coroutine and to do that you put dot launch and if uh, you feel confused by what i talked about here about the default and main don't worry because uh, in the next videos i will go into much detail about them so we put that launch and now this is this creates the coroutine as you can see it's a disk coroutine scope now if you run this code you're gonna see something uh, interesting you get main program starts and then you get main the name of the thread then main, you get main program ends and you get the name of the thread but we don't get uh, our fake work starts and our fair work fake work finish why this is because by default the program does not wait for the coroutine to finish the work it's, it's, it, in comparison with the thread as i said for the thread the application ways to finish its, its work but for the coroutine it's not doing that so what we can do what what we can do is that we can type here thread dot sleep and you can put here to 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 five mill to five milliseconds and now this will make the thread to sleep for uh, two and a half uh, seconds and because this only takes two seconds we will get our uh, output in the console so if i run this now but this is not recommended to do in a real app so you get uh, default dispatcher worker one and get main program ends so now our uh, output works our program works so you get main program starts then you get our fake work so you get our uh, work on the which is on the coroutine and then you get main program ends and then the process so now it's waiting because we said here explicitly to Pause the thread to for two and a half seconds, and the, because this works only takes only two seconds, then it will uh, have enough time to to finish this. But as I said, by default, it's not waiting to for the coroutine to finish. But if you think about this, is not this is not a solution because if uh, 
instead of thread asleep because here you pretend you do some work you have a function which is getting some data from the internet you will have no idea how much time that it, it will take so what we can do in that case in that case we will need to use something else and uh, i'm going to show you what uh, what you can use instead of instead of uh, thread asleep here to make to, to wait for the coroutine uh, in a sh in a short time so now let's think about this thread that sleep that we have here so if you think about our discussion when we, when we discussed in our introduction about threads and coroutines and how they work if you have a, a bunch of coroutines inside this coroutine coroutine scope that we created because thread does because we have here thread that sleep this will make the entire thread to pause for two seconds and if you have uh, three or five coroutines all the coroutines will be stopped because the thread will be paused so you need to use something else instead so to use something else and to use uh, to, to not block the entire thread so we, we, the uh, other coroutines can do their work we're gonna use delay and delay is used because it's used because it will only pause that specific coroutine it's not gonna pause the entire thread so the the, the other coroutines can do their work uh, uh, without being uh, being uh, being stopped because the thread was paused so if i if you use delay delay means just pause this specific coroutine not not pause the entire thread let the other coroutines to do their job within that thread and just pause this coroutine so this is what means so if i run this Now we get main program starts main, then we get fake or stars, then we get our uh, pretending work, which is this, which delays the delays the core routine for two seconds, and then we get main program ends. Now, as I said in a real app, you'll not you'll not know how much time it will take for the core routine to finish its work. So you cannot uh, use thread that sleep and pass uh, a specific number here because you'll not know how much time it will take to do the work. So what we can do instead is we can delete this. So if you go up here and we press and hold control over the launch and if you click, it's gonna take us here and we're gonna see that this is an extension function and it returns a job object. And what is this job object? This job object basically allows us to have some control of, over, a, uh, over a specific coroutine. So if I type here val, I'm gonna call this variable parent job because this is where uh, this is the parent coroutine if you want because as you'll see later we're gonna add uh, some child coroutines inside our uh, coroutine scope that we created. Now what we can do down here because uh, the let's type parent here because this uh, job is uh, offering us uh, some control over the coroutine, we can instead of uh, uh, typing thread asleep and uh, waiting for a for a specific time we can say to, we can say to the core you can say to the compiler to wait for this core for the coroutine to finish its work and then uh, finish the, the program so i can type it parent job and to make uh, to make the compiler to to wait for the coroutine to finish we type parent job dot join and this basically is going to is gonna say, say to the compiler, hey, wait for this coroutine that was defined here. Wait to finish uh, its work, and only after that uh, finish uh, finish the the application or the program. But we have a problem here. And if you hover over here, it says suspend function join should be called only from a coroutine or another suspending function. Anyway, this is also a suspend function, as you can see if I pre hold control on it. Now. What are suspending functions? Suspending functions are functions which are mark are marked with the suspend modifier. And they 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 are not core routines, but they can only be called from a core routine. You can never call a suspend function uh, from uh, not from a core routine. So as you can see, this uh, delay is a suspend function, has the suspend uh, keyword there. And uh, now what we can do here to 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 because here we're not inside the coroutine so we cannot call join because you can only call a suspending function from a coroutine here we can use what is called a run blocking and run a run blocking creates a coroutine 
and uh, we can put now this code here and paste it here. I typed run catching, not run blocking. So let's change this to run blocking. And now the error disappeared because now this creates a coroutine, this run blocking. The problem with run blocking is that the run blocking also block, blocks the thread. But this uh, this is the only way in which I can present uh, the code. So in a real app, you're probably going to just type parent job that join and that is going to work. But uh, here we need to you need to call this from within a coroutine because uh, this is a suspending function and a suspending function can only be called from a coroutine. Now, if I run this code, look what happens because now you said to the compiler, you said to the program, hey, wait for this to finish. Now we get main program starts main, fake word starts and we, got, we get our, uh, our uh, thread on which uh, the coroutine is operating and then we get also our thread on which the code is operating. On also on another important thing to know is that even though the the coroutine is uh, operating let's say on this thread when it starts it may happen that when uh, the coroutine uh, ends so when you execute this line of code to to end to 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 do the work on another thread so this is also important uh, to know and now if i change this to let's say uh, five seconds and if i run now because here you said parent job that join, so wait for this coroutine to finish uh, its job. It's gonna wait five seconds, then it's gonna say fake or finish, then it said main program ends and get main. Now I'm gonna close the console and uh, I'm gonna continue our discussion in the next video. Now it's time to start a discussion about coroutine builders, and also in this video, I'm gonna show you how to create your own suspending functions. So what are coroutine builders? As the name implies, coroutine builders are some functions with which you can create coroutines. And there are three coroutine builders that you are gonna use. And those are launch, the one that we have here, the async and the run blocking that we have here. And we're gonna look first at launch. And, but first I'm gonna create a few suspending functions. Now to create a suspend function, just type, uh, I'm gonna make this function private suspend fun and I'm gonna call it get data one and this is gonna return a result I'm gonna gonna mimic the behavior of getting the data from the internet so I'm gonna add a print line here actually let's define an argument here call it uh, let's call it thread name we're gonna be of type string and we're gonna add here print line and I'm gonna type fake work one starts dollar sign and the thread name. So it should be thread name here. All right. Then we're gonna delay this uh, spending function. So we're gonna delay because this is gonna be called from a coroutine. We're gonna delay the coroutine for two seconds. Then I'm gonna add another print line, which is gonna say that the fake work one finished and the thread name. And we're gonna create another function. But first, let's return something because we need to return. I'm gonna return the string result one, right? Now I'm gonna create another function. So I'm gonna copy this, but this is gonna be called get data two. So I'm gonna paste here. I'm gonna call it get data two, and it's gonna be be called fake work two, fake work two, and it's gonna return result two. Now let's delete the code that we have inside our uh, coroutine scope. Uh, so let's delete the code that we have inside our coroutine scope. And uh, first we're gonna look at the launch coroutine builder. And to use the launch coroutine builder, you just type launch. And you, then we have the lambda expression and, and here we're gonna use our code. And, and I'm gonna call our get data one function. And here I'm gonna type thread, that current thread 
that name. So because this function expects uh, an argument, a string, and gonna pass the current thread on each this uh, this uh, coroutine uh, is working. And uh, gonna put here val result one because this returns a string which is called result one. And I'm gonna add here print line result one. Now I'm gonna create another uh, coroutine so with uh, also the coroutine builder launch so I'm gonna type launch and have a suggestion press enter and I'm gonna type here val result 2 equals get data 2 and here I'm gonna type again thread that current thread that name and I'm gonna output in the, co the console uh, read the val which is returned by the result 2 Let's press Ctrl Alt to format the code and let's run our code to see what we have in the output. So this is how you can create your own suspending function. This is how you can use them inside your uh, uh, coroutines because this coroutine builder launch creates coroutines. So we have two coroutines here. And as you'll, you'll see, they are uh, running in parallel. So as you can see, they start both at the same time and they also end at the same time. So we have So we have on the output, main program starts, main, then have fake work one starts, and we have default dispatcher, dispatcher worker two. Then we get fake uh, work two starts, so our second uh, function is called. And we have a different name for the thread, so we have fake, we have default dispatcher work, worker three. After that, uh, it says fake uh, work one finished, and we have the name of the thread, Then and then we have result one, this value here, printed. After that, we get fake word to fin finish, and then we have the name of the thread also, from here. And then we have uh, result two, which is returned from our second uh, suspend function, get data two, and then we get main program ends, and then we get process finish with exit equals zero. So our application finished there. And what we have here is, first we have a parent coroutine, which is this coroutine that we define here, so this one, and this, inside this parent coroutine we have two child coroutines, this one and this one, and uh, those coroutines are non-blocking in nature, and what that means is that they don't, they, they launch a new coroutine which is not blocking the current thread, in contrast with the RAM blocking uh, uh, builder coroutine, this is block, blocking the the main thread, but those coroutines which the coroutines created with the launch uh, coroutine builder, they create a coroutine which is non-blocking, which is not blocking the current uh, thread. And if you press control here, because uh, we already looked at this, this returns a job object. And with that job object, we can have uh, control over the coroutine. So I'm going to type here val, and I'm going to call it job1, I'm going to put equals because that function returns uh, a job object, then val, job2, I'm going to put equals launch. So now if you hover over here, you see that this is of type job. This is because the launch uh, coroutine builder is returning a job, uh, a job uh, object. And now we, have con we can have control over the coroutines. You can also, you can, uh, as we saw with the parent, the parent, uh, job coroutine, we can uh, join, then we can wait for the coroutine, but you can also cancel the coroutine. So if you want to have those coroutines that we have here, uh, uh, the job one and job two, to run in sequence and not in parallel, you can just type here job one, that join. And this now will, f will wait for the first coroutine to finish execution, and then you know, after that is gonna execute the second coroutine that we created here. So if you run this, look at the output. We get fake uh, work one starts, then we get fake work one finish and get the result returned. So we get the first one, the first uh, coroutine, and then it executes the next coroutine. So they are executed in sequence and um, to show you this more clearly, I'm gonna create a variable here. I'm gonna call it val start time. And we're gonna get the current time in milliseconds. I'm gonna type system dot current time in milliseconds. And that is gonna give us the, the current time in milliseconds. And uh, at the end here, I'm gonna type 
print line. I'm gonna type total time colon dollar sign. I'm gonna type system that current time in milliseconds minus start time. And that is gonna give us the total time that it took to to finish the the to finish to, for the parent job to finish the work which was in, which is the, which is done by the coroutines ch child in the inside. So now if you run this, get fake work one starts. So you get them in sequence. You get the result on, and you get the total time is uh, four seconds and. Uh, a few milliseconds there. This is because they are uh, they are running in sequence and not in parallel. But if I delete the job one that joins, so we're not saying to wait for the first coroutine to finish. We now we're uh, we're uh, by default they are gonna be started at the same time. And now look at the time that is gonna be show here. So now they both start at the same time. We get um, fake work uh, fake work one. Uh, fake work one uh, starts, fake two or start, then you get fake one finish, you get the result on, then you get fake work to finish and you get the name of the thread and then look at the time, you get only two seconds this time even though the total time for uh, both uh, both coroutines is four seconds. We get two seconds because they are started at the same time by default. So if because I didn't put job on the join, they are uh, started and executed at the same time. So this is why I get only two seconds here. Even though inside the suspending function we have uh, two seconds for the first one and two seconds for the second one because they are started at the same, at the same time, you only have uh, two seconds. So um, this is the launch coroutine builder. Next, we're gonna look at the async coroutine builder and the async coroutine builder is very similar with the launch coroutine builder. The only difference is what uh, the, the, uh, the async coroutine builder is returning. Because with the launch coroutine builder, the, the value which is returned by this function get data one and by the function get data two is stuck inside the coroutine. So we cannot get that data outside of the coroutines. But with the async coroutines, as you will see, we can get that data outside. So we're gonna look at that now. So now let's look at the async coroutine builder and for that I'm gonna hide the console and uh, we just change the launch to async. So I, if I type async we have a suggestion and we fill that. And we do the same thing here. Also async. And now if you run this you'll not see a difference uh, in the output but I'm gonna show you how with the async you can get the data we can get data outside of the coroutine so we get uh, the same uh, output no big difference so they are very similar i'm gonna hide the, the console but what we can do now instead of adding the print lines inside the coroutine and getting this data inside the coroutine what we can do with uh, async is that we can return this value so the last line of code which is which is uh, inside the async uh, coroutine is going to be returned back here so here so let's let's change this let's press control alt l now because this get data one uh, function is returning a string that string is going to be returning this variable job one and you can see this is now of type defer string so let's put that let's call it uh, job deferred and it's going to be of type deferred and this is this can be a generic type and we're going to type string here and we're going to do the same thing for this job deferred and it's going to be of type uh, job deferred uh, 2 and it's going to be of type uh, deferred the generic string all right let's call this actually job there for one and now the value which is uh, which is which, which is gonna which is gonna be returned by the get data one now it's gonna be stored in this job there for one so if i hover over here you can see that this is of type job deferred it's, it's of type deferred string the same here 
Now, how we can use that data? To use that data, we can now outside the core routines, we can add a print line here and we can use what is called the await function. So we can type here job deferred one dot await and that is gonna give us the, the value which is returned by the get data one function. I'm gonna add a plus here. I'm gonna put uh, quotation marks, uh, forward, uh, backless n to add a space. I'm gonna put dollar sign to get the data for the job defer two. So I type job defer two dot await. And that if you hover over this, or if you press, uh, 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 what this is gonna do is gonna return us the string. Uh, this is gonna return result one, this is gonna return result two. So now if you run this, look uh, at what you get in the output. So they they also start at the same time, they finish at the same time, as you can see in the output. So we have this, uh, fake or one starts, fake two, one, fake two starts, fake one work, fake uh, work one finished and fake work two finished. Then we get result one and result two. And this, the result one and result two is from this print line that we have here. And this is, uh, uh, given to us by the job defer that await and that is going to give us the value which is returned. Then we get the total time uh, which is almost, uh, you have, you have uh, two seconds and a few milliseconds there. And then we get uh, main program ends and you have process finish with x equal zero. So this is how you can, with the async, you can get the data outside of the coroutine. And the data is, uh, is the last line of code. So if I type here 12 now, uh, now we have an error because this is defined here deferred of type string and uh, we're returning uh, an integer. So it says type mismatch required deferred uh, should be required. Uh, it's correct, required string and it found uh, int. So if you change this to int, there is no problem. So the last line of code inside your uh, your uh, core routine cre created the core routine builder async is going to be the value which is going to be returned back to the to the variable here and it's going to be the value which is going to be here so let's change it back to a string let's delete this and now we have no problem so this is how you can use the launch core routine builder and this is how you can use the async core routine builder and uh, next we're going to look at what is global scope and why the, uh, using the global scope is, disco is discouraged. And uh, with uh, job deferred, we can also use uh, the join and cancel function. At cancel function, we didn't look uh, yet, but we're gonna look uh, in our next videos. Because this defer that we have here is uh, inheriting from the job class. So it, uh, because it's inheriting from the job class, you can use the join and uh, cancel function. So you, you can type here, job deferred one dot and have join cancel and uh, so you can use those if you want and there is another interesting uh, function that you can use uh, using uh, the, the job uh, object and that is the invoke on completion so what you can do down here is you can use our parent job and put that and type invoke on completion and this function is going to be called when the parent job finishes the work. So when the all the child coroutines are finish are finishing uh, their job and the parent job uh, also finish finish f by that finishes the job, this function is going to be invo invoked. And uh, as you can see, uh, you have a lambda function. We have it throwable. So we can type here it question mark dot let so if uh, there is a throwable so if there is an exception we're gonna say a print line and uh, we're gonna say uh, parent job failed and we're gonna put colon dollar sign and it it that message because gonna get the message the error message otherwise we're gonna put uh, the Elvis operator so I'm gonna put question marks question mark and uh, colon and if there is not if uh, 
the trouble is uh, null, we don't have any trouble, that means that the parent has succeeded. So we type here parent job success with two yes here. Now, if you run this code, look what happens. We get our uh, two coroutines starting and finishing at the same time, get result one and result two. And uh, we also get parent job success because our because all of our uh, child coroutines uh, finish, finish their work. The parent job also, uh, because of that, finished uh, execution and it finished with uh, success because we didn't, didn't have any error inside the, in all of our child. We're going to look at uh, how we can uh, have errors in the child and what you can do with the, in, a, in a rapport with the parent if you have an error and uh, so on. But for now, just uh, know that this invoke on completion is called when uh, the parent job uh, completes the, com is completing the work. So when, when, when all the child coroutines are finishing the work, the parent job also finishes. And we get result on result on, and you get parent job success because there is no error. So this is also an interesting function to to know about. And uh, next we're gonna look at the global scope and why the global scope is discouraged to use. Now, what is global scope? First, let's say that you launch an application and you are currently, let's say, in the login screen. And within this login screen, uh, you will launch a core routine. Let's call it core routine one. And then you navigate to another screen called home screen. And uh, within this home screen, you launch another coroutine called, let's say, coroutine two. Now, if you navigate now back from the home screen to the login screen, the coroutine two is gonna be destroyed when the screen two is gonna be destroyed. And this, this happens because the coroutine, the coroutines in the way that we launch them here they exist only locally so they exist bound to the activity or the screen where they launch so when the screen gets destroyed the 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 local coroutine also gets destroyed now if you launch a coroutine globally no matter from what uh, screen you launch that uh, uh, coroutine, it will survive the entire life, lifespan of the application. So even all, even though if all the screens are destroyed, the, coroutine, the global coroutine will still uh, work in the background. So this is the difference between uh, 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 launching a coroutine locally. So if you launch it locally, it's it bounded to the screen from which it's launched. And if launch it globally, it's not bounded to the screen from which it's launched. It's, it can run in the background the entire life, lifespan of the application. Now, the question that may arise is when to use, uh, when to launch a coroutine globally, so when to use global scope, and when to use uh, local scope. And uh, the answer to the question is that it depends. And let's say that you click on a button to download the file. And uh, if you want to download the file, you should download the, f the file in a coroutine which is uh, started globally because you, you want to start downloading the file and then to, uh, you want to move on with, with the ongoing activities of, with, with, of that specific app. So that, uh, download, that downloading, the f the, the downloading the file should not uh, interfere with, with the ongoing activities uh, that you are currently doing in that app. Or uh, another example is playing some music. You just uh, start the music and you want to have that music uh, playing in the background and it should not interfere with, uh, again, with what you are doing uh, in that app. And in those cases, you should use global scope. You should use local, local scope when you want to do a thing and you want to end that thing there. Let's say that you want to log in a user. In that case, you log in the user and then you move on to to let's say to the next uh, screen and you end end that code in there. In that case, you should use local scope. So this is when, and uh, I'm gonna show you how to use global scope. You just uh, delete this here. And instead of coroutine scope, we type global global scope that launch. And this is how you start a, a global a coroutine globally. And uh, let's press Ctrl Z to undo this. And you can also do the same thing here. So instead of async, here we can type global scope. So we can type here global 
scope dot launch but now we have an error because this uh, here we said to that this type re returns something and the global scope is not returning something so let's press control z so this is how you will start uh, coroutine globally and i'm gonna end the video now and the ne in the next video we're gonna look at uh, cancellations exceptions and timeouts so we'll see you in the next video so now it's time to start a discussion about cancellations, timeouts and exceptions and we're gonna look at the first one and that is cancellation. And the question that may arise now is why we want to cancel a coroutine in the first place. And the answer to that question is that you want to cancel a coroutine, let's say, when it's taking too much time to do some uh, specific work. In that case, you will need a mechanism to cancel that coroutine. Secondly, let's say it uh, may happen that you no longer need that uh, result that the coroutine returns. In that uh, case, you also need a mechanism to stop, to cancel that coroutine. And uh, another very important thing is that in, in order to be able to cancel a coroutine, that coroutine has to be cooperative. And that means that the functions which are used inside the coroutine have to be part of this package, kotlinx.coroutines. And if the functions which are using that inside that coroutine are not part of this package, you're not, you're not going to be able to cancel the coroutine. Now, I'm going to change this now a little bit to, to a launch and not to async. So let's type launch here. Let's change this to job one. also here and we're going to output the result that this function returns in the console so I'm going to add the directly this in the print line so I'm going to add this directly in the print line also here let's change this to get data to and let's comment this line of code because we don't need this code anymore and let's run our code the way it is now to see what we get in the output So we get in the output fake work one starts, fake two work starts, then get fake uh, work one finish, we get a result one, then we get fake two, fake work two finish, and we get a result two, parent job success, total time two seconds. So uh, our output uh, works well. Now, let's say that I want to cancel the first coroutine, which is uh, returning the variable job one. So I, I can type here job one that and to cancel a coroutine you type cancel now i'm also going to type job one that join because if the coroutine is not this let's say that the code is not uh, able to cancel the coroutine then we're going to wait for the coroutine to finish and those functions are so used uh, in conjunction that there is a um, there is a function which combines those two but i'm going to show you this after i run this code so let's run this code now so now we cancel the coroutine one immediately after uh, we launch it. So let's see what happens. We get fake one, work, work one starts, fake work two starts and get now fake work two finished. And we don't get fake work one finished because it was canceled. And very interesting, we get result two, but we don't get result one because our coroutine was canceled. And we get parent job success. And this is also very interesting to see how uh, the cancellation, it is propagating to the next coroutine respectively of the coroutine 2 and how it propagates to the parent coroutine so the parent even though we cancel this coroutine the parent uh, is uh, is uh, is uh, not uh, throwing an error it says that is success and it took also two two seconds now 
as I said, let's change now this delay function and this delay function is part of that package that I talked about and I'm going to change it to thread.slip. So let's see if now I can cancel this coroutine because that thread.slip is not part of this package. So in uh, theory, theory, I should not be able to cancel the coroutine because that that code that the code that we have here is not part of that pa package. So our coroutine is not cooperative and we can't cancel the coroutine. So if you run our code now, as you can see, you get fake core one starts, fake core one finished, result one. So if again, we get fake core two starts, so we get our fake core one. So our uh, first coroutine was not canceled because it's no, not cooperative. And that means that uh, the functions which are used inside that coroutine are not part of this package and thread that slip is not part of that package but delay is part of that package so if I change this back to delay and if I run this code we get fake work one starts fake work to start and get fake work to finish and fake work one we don't get that it finished and get only the result two and get parent job success so now our, our uh, coroutine is cooperative and that means that it's cancelable and you can also combine those functions in one function because uh, the join function is going to work only if the cancellation fails so we can combine this in one function called job one cancel and join and this will give us the same output. So if you run this code, we get fake work one starts, fake work two starts, and we get only the result two because the fake, uh, the first coroutine was canceled and we don't get any result back. And it, uh, the cancellation didn't propagate to the parent. So it didn't uh, cause the parent to also fail. And uh, it also do, didn't, didn't cause the second coroutine to fail. The second coroutine, uh, it, it worked uh, independently. It, didn't, it, was, it wasn't affected by the fact that this was cancelled. Now, there is also a Boolean flag called it's active, which is going to return true if the coroutine is active, and it's going to return false if the coroutine has been cancelled, so if the coroutine is uh, not active. And to access that Boolean flag, uh, you can type here if. I'm going to put not so if it's not active then return so return to the launch and then mean, that means that it's gonna break this uh, coroutine so if you run this code we get fake work on stars fake to work to start and then you get result of parent of success and so our code works well and uh, this flag even though it's not showing very clear here what it's doing but if you have some work you can say to you can you can put a if check and if uh, that is not active you can uh, break that work which the coroutine is doing this is bar very powerful to have this internal uh, boolean flag to check whatever the, whether the coroutine is active or not next we're gonna look at how to handle exceptions because when you cancel a coroutine what is actually happening is that the, the function, respectively the delay function, is gonna is gonna throw an exception. And to show you that, I'm gonna wrap our uh, our code into a try catch, and I'm gonna ca catch here can cancellation exceptions. I'm gonna put curly brace. I'm gonna put here a print line, and I'm gonna type exception cut safely I'm gonna also add a finally block and I'm gonna add a print line here which is gonna say which is gonna say resources closed safely so let's put our code which is gonna throw the exception Let's press Ctrl Alt L and let's put here uh, dollar sign X that message. Now if you run this code we get exception cast safely, standalone coroutine was cancelled and get resource or resources closed closely, closed safely. And uh, so we can uh, wrap your code in a try and catch to catch the exception, but 
what if you uh, cancel the coroutine too? And as you'll see, if you throw your own exceptions, you know, what you're gonna do if you have job one, job three, job four, job five, what you're gonna do in that case? You cannot wrap, uh, actually you can wrap all of all of that uh, coroutines in a try catch, but the code is gonna be very messy. And for that, we have uh, something else when, with, about which I'm gonna talk a little bit later. For now, you, you just need to know that uh, the cancellation, the cancel, when you cancel a local routine, that's going to throw an exception. You can catch that an exception and try catch as you see, as you saw in the output here. So, right. But before we move to the next section, let me show you how you can uh, uh, use your own cancellation message. So, I can uh, put here cancel. And as you can see, this expects as uh, an argument a cancellation exception. And let's put here job one dot join. So here I can type cancellation exception, and I can I put I, I can put a message here my own error message. So now if you run this, this exception is going to be catch by or try and catch here and you're gonna see when, when it's gonna edit this line of code x that matches you're gonna see our message so if you run this so you can see exception uh, so exception cut safely my own error message so the exception was cut by our try and catch and it uh, outputted the, the the message that we typed here. So this is how you can uh, you, uh, type your own, uh, uh, your own message for uh, the cancellations. So I'm going to close this. Now let's look at timeouts. And let's say that uh, a coroutine is taking more time than expected to finish some work. In that case, you can use timeouts and you can specify uh, an amount of time that you think that, that coroutine should finish the job. And if not, then that coroutine is going to be canceled. And uh, we have two 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 coroutine builders, two coroutine timeouts builders, and that is timeout uh, with timeout and with timeout or null. But first, let's delete this code. So let's delete this code because we don't need this code now. This also. This also. This also. And we can so. With timeout, this also a coroutine builder with the difference that uh, it will uh, receive, as you can see here, a parameter of milliseconds. So let's put here, let's say, 1000 milliseconds. And because our coroutines, our, our uh, get data one, it will take more than 1000 milliseconds, it will take 2000 milliseconds. That is gonna, is gonna, is gonna fail, it's gonna throw an error. So if you run this, and this also, as you can see, a coroutine builder, but with this difference that has this here. So we get timeout waiting for 1000 milliseconds. So it says parent job failed. That's because our coroutine takes more than one, one second that we pass here to finish the work. And for that, it failed. So, and because of that, it failed. But if I change this to, let's say, 3000 milliseconds, and if I run this code, Now everything works fine because uh, because uh, because the time that we pause for a four hour with timeout is uh, longer than the time it took for the coroutine to finish its job. So this is with uh, timeout, and let's look at the next uh, timeout, and that is with timeout or null. So if we type here with timeout or null. We also pass milliseconds here. Let's put one thousand milliseconds, and now if you run this. Now we get uh, we get in the output fake work one starts fake work two starts but we get only result of parent job succeeds and we get three three seconds here and uh, with uh, the difference with uh, with timeout or null is that uh, with timeout or null is not going to throw any error but with timeout or null can return a value so if I put here twelve this value now is going to be returned in this variable so you can see now job job one is of type int nullable nullable int. And you can use that variable in your code. So you can put here print line. 
job one and that is our uh, 12 our value that is written there and uh, if if this uh, uh, times out so it uh, it uh, basically didn't finish uh, in the time that we pass here then it's, then it's gonna return null so uh, if I put here a print line and if I put job one because this is uh, only 1000 milliseconds and our work takes two that is gonna return a null in our variable so if you run this as you can see we have null that is the print line that we have and we have the, the next the output that we have here so this is how you can use timeouts next we're gonna look at how you can throw your own exceptions and how you can how those exceptions are gonna affect the the child coroutines and the parent so I'm gonna delete this code I'm gonna change this back to lunch So now it's time to look at how we can throw exceptions inside our coroutines and how those uh, exceptions are going to affect the other coroutines and how it will affect also the parent coroutines or how it will propagate to the parent coroutine if we if one of the child coroutines it throws an exception how it's going to affect the other child coroutines and also how it's going to affect the parent and for that I'm going to go down here and I'm going to create another private uh, spending function I'm gonna copy this one and I'm gonna call it get data tree. So let's paste it here and let's call it get data tree. Fake work tree starts and fake work tree finished. And let's return result tree here. Now let's go up here and uh, let's create another uh, coroutine here. So we type uh, val job tree equals and we're gonna create a coroutine using the launch coroutine builder and we're gonna add a print line here and we're gonna type get data tree and now for the parameter uh, thread name we're gonna type thread that current thread that name and that is gonna give us the current the name of the current thread now if you run this code we get all of our coroutines starting uh, at the same time and uh, we get then uh, work uh, one finished uh, actually let's go down here because I, th I think I missed something so get work one uh, finished work three finished then we get work two finished we get result uh, get result three result one result uh, two so our code works okay and get we, we have only two seconds for all of our coroutines even though they uh, together if they are executed sequen sequentially will take uh, six seconds but because they are starting at the same time we only have two seconds now let's say that i throw an exception inside the coroutine so let's say that i throw an exception inside this suspended function so i'm going to type it throw so this is how we can throw an exception and i'm going to uh, throw a generic exception so exception i'm going to type here and i'm going to type the text error while getting the data in get data one and I am uh, curious about how this is going to affect the other coroutines which are currently running inside our uh, coroutine, uh, coroutine uh, scope and how is that going to affect our coroutine parent. So what I am in interested in is, is if the parent will fail or the parent will, it will say that it has succeeded. So now if I run the code, let's see what happens. So now we get an exception and uh, we get main program start, fake one more starts and we get an exception and we get our message error while getting data in get data one. So we get the message that we we typed here inside our exception. And that uh, exception is uh, is the message we get it uh, from here. So we get here. Actually, no, no, not from here. Let's uh, Let's go down here. 
So we get here parent job failed, error while getting the data and get data one. So this is the message that we get here from here. So the per because first what happened? The because we throw an exception in, in the, the job one, it also caused the other jobs, job two and job three to, to fail, to, to not work, and it also uh, caused the parent to fail. And we know from the previous video that you can surround this in a try and catch. So you can type here try catch and we can type here x uh, and we're gonna we're gonna catch exception the exception that we throw in an, in the child and uh, we're gonna put curly brace you know the print line here and we're gonna type uh, exception session cut safely and we're gonna put dollar sign x that message and let's change this cool cut because that is bad English all right let's also add the finally block here finally and let's print line uh, let's say resource resource sources closed say flee all right now if you run this code because now we are uh, actually I uh, should uh, put this inside the, our try and catch so let's uh, so you get the same error because I didn't put the code there so let's copy our uh, our code which generates uh, the exception let's paste it inside the try so what we're saying now hey I know that this can potentially throw an error I know what the error is is this exception that we define here but Anyway, try to run that code and if an error occurs, just catch that exception and uh, execute uh, the code. And what I'm curious about is if the next coroutines are going to run and if the parent is going to fail or succeed. So if I run this code now, now get fake work one start, fake, uh, let's actually go up here to see. To see the output so I get main program start main fake one one start and we get accession cut safely error while getting get data one so it cut the exception that we thrown in our uh, uh, get data one function and then uh, it says resources close flows resources close safely so this is the message from the finally block and then we get our fake work to start so our, our second coroutine now it's working it's not affected by the fact that uh, it was an exception throw in the the first coroutine and get also fake work to start and we get the results for fake uh, for uh, uh, fake work one and fake work two and uh, also for a fake uh, for fake work two and fake fake work three because we get result three here result two here sorry and result three here and very important the parent job succeeds so we get parent job success so the parent didn't fail now so the error didn't propagate to the parent and and uh, it made the parent to fail so this is one way to to avoid uh, that uh, error but um, let's say that I now I throw an exception in the in the second function what can I do so let's say that I type here throw also exception and uh, let's say that's gonna say error or so quotation marks error while getting the data in get data to let's see what happens now because as I as uh, we saw previously now if uh, we run our code is gonna make our uh, program to crash and we can again surround this in a try and catch block and uh, so we can type here uh, try catch and we can type here x and exception we can add the print line here which is gonna say uh, exception safely So we're gonna type here dollar sign x dot message also the finally block so finally also print line which is gonna say 
resources closed safely. So the file in the block is going to be executed no matter what happens here. So let's move the let's uh, move the code that we have here inside our try. Let's paste it here. Now let's run our code. And because we we've surrounded our code within with a try and a catch block, it now it also didn't cause the it didn't cause the third coroutine to fail and it also didn't cause the parent so we get uh, we get here parent job success and we only get result three because uh, the other coroutines uh, for the other coroutines we get uh, so we get here error why getting the data and get data one and then we get uh, uh, accession cut safely error get and while getting the data and get data two so we only get the result for uh, our uh, coroutine three so but if you look at this code, it's kind of messy because imagine if I have uh, 10 coroutines or 20 coroutines, then what can I do? I can surround them with all of them or try and catch. I can do that, but that is going to look messy. And uh, there is another way to to handle all of this using what is called the coroutine exception handler and a supervisor job. So what you can do instead, instead of surrounding our code to try and catch, you can delete this code that we have. So we can delete this. Let's delete this. Let's delete this also. This is also. Let's press Control Alt L to format the code. And now if you run the code, you get uh, our Apple is, is going to crash. So our app crashed and also the, par the parent uh, failed to get error while getting the data and get data one. Now, instead of surrounding our code with uh, try and catch, we can create what is called the coroutine handler. And to create a coroutine handler, we can type here val and we type handler and we have a suggestion for the time coroutine handler and we put equals coroutine exception handler and this is going to be a lambda expression and for the first argument we're going to put underscore because we're not going to use the first argument we don't you don't need that argument and the first for the second argument we type exception so we type exception we put uh, the arrow sign so because it is a lambda expression and we add the print line here which is going to say print line error in one of the children and we put uh, colon and we put dollar sign exception that message now what we can do now instead of surrounding uh, our uh, each is uh, surrounding each particular uh, uh, child coroutine in a try and catch block we can pass this handler that we created here to the parent coroutine and if well, if uh, if an exception is thrown in one of the children that exception is going to be handled is going to be handled by this handler that we created now but this only works if uh, we use our handler with the supervisor scope in conjunction so if i only pass here let's if we put here parenthesis and if i type here handler so this now is going to handle if, if there is an exception thrown in one of the chi child uh, coroutines which are inside the coroutine scope. So now if you run this code, now we'll get an error and the parent will fail because we also need to use uh, the supervisor scope. So we get error in one of the children. At least our app didn't crash, so we didn't get the exception, but we get error while getting get data in get data one and parent job failed. So our parent job failed and it also caused the, the other coroutines to fail and to use the to to make use of this handler we can type here supervisor scope so supervisor scope we choose this one lambda expression press enter and we move our code which we want to supervise if you want so you want to look at this code at those coroutines at those child coroutines to see if they throw an error and if they throw an error that error is going to be handled by our uh, handler that we created up here and it's going to it's going to 
show this message as error error in one of, in one of the children and it's going to say exception it's going to uh, it's going to output the message for the particular uh, coroutine so we surrounded our uh, child coroutines with uh, the supervisor's scope lambda expression we defined we pass our handler to the coroutine parent and now we're saying hey if an error is thrown in all of the child in all, in all of the child coroutines then handle this uh, handle this uh, error and uh, make sure that it's not propagating to the next uh, coroutines and it's not affecting the parent coroutine the coroutine that is uh, the which is the parent for the child coroutine so now if you run this code look what happens so previously we got that the parent failed and now we get so now we get we get we get that error while getting the data in get data one so we get error in one of the children so we get the message that we have up here error in one of the children and we get uh, accession that message so we get uh, this message and then we get fake or two stars and this uh, uh, suspending functions this this coroutine also throws an exception so we get a, again error in one of the children now we get error uh, while getting data the data and get data two then we get fake three uh, fake work three starts so our third uh, coroutine uh, st uh, starts and we get fake work three finish so now our uh, third coroutine is not affected by the fact that the first and the second uh, coroutine so our uh, third coroutine is not affected by the fact that our first and second coroutine failed and we also get get result three and we get we get parent job success so the parent now is, is success is not showing an error so this is how you can throw exceptions and this is how you can handle those exceptions using the handler the coroutine exception handler you can you can pass it here and you can you surround your code your uh, child coroutine with the supervisor scope and it's going to be handled by that instead of surrounding each in individual coroutine we try and catch and that's going to look messy but you can just type this and that is going to take care of uh, the errors so that the error is not propagating to the next coroutines and to the parent coroutine and uh, you can also throw another exception which is called a cancellation exception and that's a, a, it's a special exception and if you throw that exception that exception is not going to cause the other coroutines to fail so there is uh, another exception that you can throw and that exception is not going to propagate to the other coroutines which are currently working in that uh, coroutine scope and it's also not going to propagate to the parent and let me show you how you can use that so let's comment this code and instead of exception we can type here this special exception called cancellation exception now if i remove the supervisor scope let's say and uh, also the handler as I said, this is not going to propagate to the other coroutines and it's not, uh, it's not going to affect the parent. All right, so if I run the code now, let's press Ctrl T to format the code. So we get all, all three coroutines starting and uh, we get, uh, we get, uh, work to finish or to finish so work one didn't finish because it, it threw that cancellation exception but it didn't cause the other coroutines respectively coroutine two and coroutine three to to fail and it also uh, didn't cause the parent to fail as you can see here the parent is success so even though we didn't uh, use any kind of try and catch or uh, the supervisor's job with the handler so this is another session that you can throw in our uh, code and I'm going to end this video and in the next video I'm going to look at how we can uh, execute uh, coroutines uh, sequentially, concurrently, in other words in parallel and uh, lazily. Now it's time to see how we can execute our code sequentially, concurrently and lazily. And for that I'm going to delete the supervisor scope because you don't need this. I'm going to delete the handler because we also don't need this. Now, uh, we already touched a little bit on this, on how to execute our code uh, sequentially and how to execute our code uh, concurrently in parallel. And uh, 
to execute uh, by default the way we have the code now this code is going to be executed but first let's go down here to see if i have an exception yeah, i have this exception so let's delete this so by default the way we have uh, our uh, coroutines defined here they're going to be executed in parallel so by default the, they are going to be started in parallel and you saw that uh, when you look at how uh, much time it took to to launch and finish uh, their uh, their uh, their work so if you run this code this uh, those coroutines are going to be executed in parallel as you saw in the last video so you can see they start all at the same time and we get result 2, result 3, result 1, parent job su success, and we get total time 2 seconds, even though the if you add the time of all of our uh, uh, spending function, it's 6 seconds, but because they start in, they, they are started in uh, parallel, so they start at the same time, it only took 2 seconds to execute all of them. Now, if you want to execute them sequentially, so one after another, and in that case you're gonna have six seconds, you just type job one dot join, and that means that wait for this uh, wait for this coroutine to finish, and then execute the next coroutine. And let's do the same thing for job two. So job two dot join. So what we are saying now is first wait for the first coroutine to finish and then execute the second coroutine and also uh, wait for the second coroutine to finish and then execute the third coroutine and now if you run this pay attention at the total time that it took to execute all of them so if you run our code and if you look at the output as you can see it says fake work one starts fake work one finish result one fake work two starts fake work two finish fake work three starts fake work three finish so they are executed sequentially sequentially so you get result three parent job success and the total time is six seconds so this is because now they are executed uh, one after another so one finishes the next starts the the second finishes the next one starts so the total time, this way the total time now is 6 seconds. So this is how you can ex execute uh, the code sequentially. sequentially. The next uh, way of executing our uh, coroutines is lazily. And lazily means that we're going to execute our uh, coroutines only if we use the result that the coroutines uh, gave us back in the code. So let's delete this because we don't need this. And I'm going to change the launch to async because it's going to illustrate better how that is going to work. So I'm going to change this to async. So async. So this is just a different coroutine builder. We looked at this in our video was about coroutines builders. Async. Also async. And uh, I'm going to delete this because now this value is going to be returned in the, in the variable job3 also here also here because the, fu the function get data1 and get data2 and 3 return a value and that value is going to be returned in, in those variables so as you can see we have variable uh, first it's of type the first thing I'm not going to type the type, the type again because uh, it can be inferred now I'm going to uh, uncomment this code and uh, I'm gonna type job uh, one that await job two that await and uh, I'm gonna put uh, back a plus back uh, I'm gonna put quotation marks uh, forward slash n and I'm gonna type uh, job three dollar sign actually job three that job3 that await and if you press uh, shift control p as you can see this whole uh, expression is of type string so this is going to return the value that is going to be returned by those functions so it's going to return result 1 result 2 and result 3 so we're going to get this back that we have here and here and here now if i go up if I comment this code, let's say, and I don't use the result in my code, and I run this code, look what happens. So now I'm not using uh, the result that, that uh, the coroutines are, gave, are uh, given back in my code, but they are still executed. So as you can see here, 
they are uh, still executed and uh, and uh, we get work one finish work to finish work three, three finish and we get parent jar success but we don't use uh, we don't use the results so they don't use what those coroutines are giving back their work you not you don't use that uh, in our code so it doesn't make sense to to have them executed and in that case you can have a, uh, the coroutines starting lazily and starting lazily just means that it is gonna start the coroutine only if you use that the result that that coroutine gives back in your code and to start a coroutine lazily you type you put uh, parentheses at the end of the async so you put parentheses and you type star so this is a name argument start equals coroutine start and we choose this one coroutine start that lazy and now that coroutine is going to be started lazily it's not going to be started if you don't use uh, the result in our code also here we're going to type the same start equals coroutine star start uh, coroutine start that lazy and uh, also here start equals coroutine start that lazy let's press Control alt l and let's actually put this in a more uh, concise way so this is more concise so if i put this like this and this not this all right and let's put this uh, let's add the space here now if I run this code now, you're, gonna, you're not gonna see that the coroutines are stunted because we're not using them. Uh, you're not using the result in our code. You only get main program starts, so we get main. Now the problem is that uh, because uh, the, uh, we have it here parent job dot join, this never finishes. So let's comment this also. So comment with line comment. I don't see where it is. So let's run this again. So get main program starts, total time, and get main program ends. So now we don't get our coroutines started because you don't use them inside our code. But if you use them inside our code, so let's uncomment this. So Let's go to code and let's comment with line comment that is going to undo. Now, if I use the result in our code, so if I will use, I type print line and job one that await, job two that await and job three that await. Now, because I'm using the, them inside the, our code, I'm using the result that they are giving back. Now they're going to be started. So as you can see now, they're not uh, grayed out. So now if I run this, We get main program starts, get fake one, one start, fake one to finish, and so on. And then we get result one, result two, result three, and parent job success, total time uh, uh, six seconds. So now uh, our coroutines are uh, started because here on this line of code, we are using the result that uh, the suspending function are giving back to the variable that we define here because you use them inside our code now they are started but if you don't use them inside your code they're not going to be started they're going to be staying there and going to be started only when you use the use them in your code so this is how you can use um, this is how you can uh, uh, start uh, a coroutine lazily and now i'm going to end the video and then the analysis video going to talk a little bit more about coroutine scope so now it's time to look at the with context function and uh, to understand why you need to use the with context function and how to use the with context function. And for that, I'm going to create a new function called a new, a new suspending function. So I'm going to type private suspend fun and it's going to be called set text on main thread. It's going to have a parameter called input. It's going to be both type string. Now, we use the with context function when you want to switch uh, the, the, core, the current thread on which we are currently in to another thread. So if we are um, specifically with this function, with, if you are uh, now doing work in a back, background thread 
and uh, let's say that we want to update a, a UI component like, or like a text view or uh, something. If you try to update that uh, uh, UI, UI component from the background th thread, the app is going to crash. And what you can do in that case is that you can switch the context so you can switch the thread from the background thread uh, from, from which you are currently in to the main thread because you can update the UI only using the main thread. So you can type with context. You type main, so basically what you're saying here, hey, switch the context, uh, switch the thread from the background thread that I am currently in to the main thread because I want to do work on the main thread. And we select the first one, so we press Alt Enter. And we put curly braces and here you, you add your code to update, uh, add code to update, update the UI. And I'm going to bring uh, Android Studio to see how this looks in a real example. So as you can see here, I have uh, I have a button, I have a text view and so on. And I, this code is similar to what you have in our IntelliJ. I have a coroutine and I start the coroutine in, uh, using IO, which means input output. Then I, I have a function, a suspending function, get fake data. And uh, I have uh, to coroutines and here I have this function set text on main thread and I have this job that await and this is going to return a string value if you, you press shift uh, shift control p on this as you can see this uh, is a uh, is a string so if you press control and if you go where this function is defined this takes as an input a string and is switching the context to the main thread because on the main thread are uh, our UI components, the, the text view and the button. And we take that input, we append it, and then we assign that text to our text view. And uh, for whatever reason, I can uh, run the, the virtual phone, but if I go here to activity.main and uh, if I go to code, let's put some text here, let's say, uh, for the text, uh, text, so text, just to show you how this uh, will look. So now this uh, UI component that we have here, text, is going to be updated with the text that is given us as an input here from the from uh, from inside our core routine, and because we're inside our core routine and we are. Uh, uh, on a background thread and we want to update the UI component, we switch the context, so we switch the thread, we say with context, switch the context to main thread and then update that UI component because if you don't do that, the app will crash because you cannot update, uh, you cannot update the UI components from the background thread. So this is the with context function and this is how you can use it uh, in a real app. Now it's time to download and install SQLite database for Windows. But first, what is SQLite? SQLite is an embedded database. And what that means is that you don't require any server to create the database or to communicate with the database. You can directly create the database on your computer and you can directly communicate with the database using SQL queries. And I'm going to see what those are in the next videos. But first, let's download SQLite database. So I'm going to open my browser. You should open your browser. I'm, I'm going to type www.sqlite.com dot org click enter press enter go to download click on download and we go down here where it says windows and we choose this one which says a bundle of command line tools for managing sqlite database files including the command line shell so click on this link now the downloading will start and it was uh, immediately finished because it's a small file now i'm gonna go inside our downloads uh, file we go here i'm gonna and here we're going to extract this file. So I'm going to extract this file and uh, I'm going to extract this file here. So you extract the file. Uh, you can extract it uh, wherever you want. But I'm going to extract it here. And it opened the file for us. And if you didn't open the file, just double click on the file because you're going to copy that file uh, inside the, uh, a folder. So I'm going to right click here. So right click. Let's copy this. And we're going to put this file inside our local disk C. So I'm going to open my computer, go to local disk C. 
and I'm gonna paste this file here and I'm gonna change this change this uh, name to SQLite3 so I'm gonna type SQLite3 and I'm gonna go inside the file and here we have uh, three folders and what now uh, what next we need to do is that we need to set up the environment variable for SQLite 3 so that when we run we run the command SQLite 3 on our command line it's gonna be recognized from uh, any folder so for that we first need to copy this this uh, location so copy this so control C we go back and uh, here we go to properties inside our inside our uh, my computer so in, inside my pc go to properties and uh, if we have a different version of windows what is important is to find this uh, setting with this option which says advanced system settings so click on this and we go to environment variables because here we're going to set up our environment uh, variable for SQLite 3 and ma make sure to have path selected here so we choose this one path and we click on edit and here we have uh, here uh, there is um, uh, the SQLite uh, here is the path that I added previously because I already I, I did this uh, once but I'm going to delete this and what we need to do here is just click on new and it's going to go to the next line and I'm gonna paste the path that we copied previously here so we paste it here we we'll click on OK click on OK OK and we exit and now we're gonna open our command line to see if everything works fine so I'm gonna type command line and here we we'll type now SQLite 3 and as you can see now everything works fine we have SQLite version and we have this connected to a transit in memory database so our database was opened and uh, it's now it's ready for uh, for working so everything works fine and if you have any problems just leave me a comment and i will uh, help you to solve it so see you in the next video now i'm gonna tell you how to use sqlite database on a mac and to use sqlite database on a mac is very easy because on a mac sqlite database it's already installed and uh, I can show you here because I have Windows, but on a Mac you just need to open your terminal. So open your terminal and type in lowercase letters SQLite 3. And that is going to open the SQLite uh, 3 uh, command line shell for you. Now I'm going to show you how to use SQLite database on Linux Ubuntu. And to use the SQLite database on Linux Ubuntu is very easy because on Linux Ubuntu SQLite database is already installed. And the only thing that you need to do is to open the terminal. So I'm going to open the terminal. And now we need to open SQLite 3 command line shell. And for that we type in lowercase letters SQLite 3 and we press enter. And this opens the SQLite 3 command line shell for us. And it also shows here the version. This version can change with time. And now we're ready to go. Now it's time to create our first table. And we're also going to see how we can populate our table with data. But first I'm going to open the SQLite database. I'm going to open the command line. And I'm going to type SQLite 3. I'm going to press enter. Now to create our table, we type in uppercase letters, create table, and by convention, need, now we need to specify the name of the table, but, but by convention, the name of the table is typed in uh, lowercase letters. So I'm going to type here books. This is going to be the name of the table. And you put left parenthesis, right, right parenthesis, and uh, we put a semicolon at the end. Now inside the parenthesis, we need to specify the rows, which are going to represent each individual book. and uh, First is going to be the author name, so I'm going to type author, so this is going to be the first field, and it's going to store text, so in uppercase letters, we type text. Then we put a comma, next we type title, and this is going to store also text, because this is going to store the title of the book. Now, everything uh, will work fine if I go at the end here and I press enter, but now we're missing something which is extremely important. And that is that each row should have a unique ID so that later when you want to update let's say that uh, a specific row in our table or to delete a specific row in our table you can use that id to uh, identify that uh, specific row and you can uh, delete it or do whatever you want and for that you go at the start here not here inside the parenthesis you type id and we type here integer in uppercase letters primary key so what we're saying now to the SQLite database that you should treat this ID as the 
unique identifier for each row. This is what we, we're saying by typing here integer primary key in uppercase letters. Now I go at the end here and if I press enter and if you see no suggestion and it just goes to, it just goes to the next line, that means that everything um, worked uh, fine. So now our, uh, we have our table, but now our table is empty. So we need to insert some data on our table. And to do that, we need to use another statement and we need to type here insert to insert some information into the name of the table on uh, which you want to insert data books. And now we need to specify the fields for which you, you want to provide the data. So I'm going to type ID in parentheses, author and the uh, title. So for th those are the three fields for which I want to provide data. And uh, we close it with the right parentheses and then we type in uppercase letter values. So now I'm going to pass the actual values for the fields that you have on the left. So first is going to be the ID. I'm going to type one and the name is going to be Fyodor. And uh, in, um, I'm going to type Dostoevsky. And as you can see, this uh, the, the, now the name is in uh, quotation marks. And this is because that's, it's, it's, we said here that this is going to be a text. And next, we are going to specify the title of the book. And the title of the book is going to be The Idiot. So The Idiot. I'm going to close it with, here with uh, a quotation marks, a double quotation marks, parentheses, and then you put a semicolon here. Now, if I press enter, you don't see no errors. And that means that we have our uh, our uh, our data inserted into the table. Now, I'm going to insert another uh, data. So I'm going to type insert into books, left parenthesis. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to provide any value for the ID because I want to show you something. So I'm going to type here only author, title. And now for the values, I'm going to type values in uppercase letters. And here I'm going to type uh, First for the author name, and the author name is going to be Lev Tolstoy. And the name of the book is going to be in quotation marks, we put a comma there, Anna. In double quotation marks, we type Anna Kare Nina. So this is our second book that we insert inside our books table. So I'm going to put here at the end a semicolon. And I'm going to press enter. And because you, see, you don't see no suggestion, that means that everything works fine. Now, how you can see this data, how you can get this data back to see to see it uh, that you have that you have that, that data it has actually inserted in our table. To do that, you need to use a select from statement. So we type here at the end select, and I'm gonna uh, talk uh, more about this in the next video. But just type here select from, but we put an asterisk sign and we put from in uppercase letters and the name of the table from which you want to select the data for select from books and we put a semicolon and if you press enter now it's going to return all the rows with the, the corresponding values to us. So I'm going to press enter and as you can see it returned one and two and the, this is interesting even though we didn't pass here two this two was added automatically by the SQLite database because you said here that this is going to be an integer primary key. Even though here we didn't specify the ID, it knew it knew because we said that it's going to be an integer primary key. It knew that it has to increment that value and it has to add that value by default for us. So he put it, it um, added here too. Then we have left Tolstoy, Anna Karina. So we have our uh, two two we have our two authors and uh, with the their and with their two corresponding books. So this is how you can uh, create a table. This is how you can insert data in a table. And this is how you can also select that data from a table. You can use a select from statement. And uh, see you in the next video. All right, so now it's time to see how we can update and delete items from our books table. And we're going to start with the update. And to update an element from our books table, just type in uppercase letters update. Next, we need to specify the table on which you want to perform the update. So update the books. Next, we type in uppercase letters set. And now we need to specify which field we want to have updated. So that can be the ID, the author or the title. And I'm going to choose the author. So author and put equals 
and you put in quotation marks the new value that I want to assign to the author. So I want to assign an empty string, let's say, for the, for the author. Now, I can put a semicolon here and I can press enter, but if I do that, all the rows or the auto rows in our table are going to be updated. So it, if you have uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands, or maybe millions of, uh, of uh, rows, it will update all of them. Now, if I press enter, what you need to do is to uh, update only a specific row from our table. And to update a specific uh, row, you need to use uh, something to uh, identify that row or something which is unique to that row and we're going to use of course the ID because the ID is uh, this is different for uh, each uh, each uh, row so and to use uh, the ID uh, and we're going to use the ID with the where clause so we type here where in uppercase letters ID equals equals uh, one so what we're saying hey what we're saying now is Hey, update the books table or uh, update uh, the author name to an empty string where the ID is equal to one. So now if I press enter and if I type now select, select from books and if I press enter now, as you'll see the, the name Fyodor Dostoevsky was updated with, a, with an empty string. And if I want to have that back, you just type update again. Books set author equals to Fyodor Dostoevsky. where and this is very important id equals to one and semicolon and press enter now if i type again the select uh, statement to get the data back to get the data displayed here select from books and put a semicolon and press enter now we have fyodor dostoevsky updated back and we can also delete an item from our table and to delete an item it will be similar but we're going to use a different command then the command is delete so we type here delete from books and again we need to use the where the where uh, the where statement because the where clause because uh, we need to specify which uh, row we, we, we want to have deleted because if you don't do that it will delete all the rows so it will uh, delete all the data in our uh, table so where id let's say equals to two let's put a semicolon and let's press enter and because it's not showing anything that means that uh, it will it work and to check we're gonna type a select from books semicolon and press enter and now if we only have one row and that is the Fyodor Dostoevsky Dostoevsky and the idiot and the book that uh, the that specific author wrote because the delete uh, statement deleted our second row which was the Tolstoy. Now you can uh, you can insert it back if you want, and that is very important to use the where. So now I'm gonna end the video and see you in the next video. Alright, so now it's time to start a discussion about joins. And in our introduction video, we talked a little bit about what is a join. And a join is basically a statement which can group different data from multiple tables together. And in order to be able to group data from multiple tables together, it needs a link. And the link is usually the unique identifier, the ID. And uh, let's now see how we can use the join clause but first let's create another table i'm going to call it review so i'm going to type create table reviews and it's going to have an id so we type here id integer primary key and we also type auto increment to make sure that it's incremented Next, we type uh, name, the name of the person who wrote the review, a text, the review, also text, and the book on which this particular uh, review was uh, added. So I'm going to type here book 
underscore id close the parenthesis semicolon and press enter and now we created another table called reviews now let's insert some data in our table review so i'm going to type here insert into reviews and here we're going to choose name review and book id then i'm going to type here values and for the values we're going to put alex the review is going to be great book and the id for which i will uh, add this uh, particular uh, review is going to be one so i'm going to add for the field or the idiot uh, the review then i'm going to I'm going to close the parenthesis and I'm going to put a semicolon. And then I'm going to close the parenthesis and I'm going to put a semicolon. And I'm going to press enter. And now we have inserted our review into the table reviews. Now I'm going to type another insert. Insert into reviews. And here we're going to type amazing book for the review. I also love the movie. And let's put an ID here. And I'm going to put the ID too. So this review is going to be added for our uh, Anna Karenina book by Left Also. I'm going to press enter. And now we have inserted the data inside the reviews. Now let's select those reviews. Let's select, let's just a select from statement. So I'm going to type select from reviews to see the reviews and we have alex which wrote the review great book and anna who wrote the review amazing book and uh, alex wrote the review for the book which has the id one and uh, anna wrote the review for the book which has the id two now let's say that i want to get back the title of a book the review which has or the name of the person who wrote that review for a particular book and the review and to do that, we need to use the join clause. And, to, and I'm going to type here, select, and what I want to select. I want to select book that title. So I'm, I want to select the title of the book. It should be books, actually. Books that title. Reviews that review. So I'm going to get the review. So now I'm using the second table, reviews. And reviews that name. So I'm going to get also the name from books and now we type join and we type here reviews so gonna we are, we are going to join the reviews on let's go back here on so we type on in uppercase letters and here we type on books dot id equals reviews dot book underscore id put a semicolon now if i press enter i get uh, an error it says no such table called books and uh, that is because here you should uh, you should type you should type here books not uh, book and uh, to have that uh, statement to, to not to, to not type that statement uh, again, we can just press the up arrow key and uh, you're gonna have the statement uh, added back. So if I press the up arrow key, this on Windows works. I have the statement back. And now if I uh, go here and change this to books and press enter, let's go at the end to press enter. Now we get idiot get the review great book and the name of the person who wrote the review then we get anna karanina and we get amazing book i also love the movie and uh, we get uh, the name of the person who wrote the review anna so this is how you can use the the join clause to join different tables and to group data together and see you in the next video
Alright, so for this video I create a new table called groceries which has an ID primary key, a name text and a quantity integer and below I inserted some groceries inside our groceries table and I did that because in this video I wanted to show some aggregate functions and uh, the first one that we're gonna look at is sum and sum it can, it can uh, be used to sum the rows of uh, of a specific uh, table so in this case we can sum let's say the quantity of our uh, groceries to see in total how many groceries we have so we can type here select sum in uppercase letters open parentheses and here we type quantity so we want to sum the quantity we close the parentheses from groceries and, I put a, and uh, here we put a semicolon and we press enter and we get 16 so this is the total uh, the sum of the, all the quantities that we have so this, the, those are the number of elements that we have in our uh, table table groceries and this is the sum function and you can also get the maximum value the maximum quantity in our uh, from our table so we can type here select max and we also need to specify a row here so we specify quantity here so select max quantity we close the parenthesis from groceries and the semicolon and we press enter and we get six and we get six because this is the row which has um, or this is the element which has the the highest value and uh, we can also get the minimum value so we can type here select mean quantity so we specify the row from groceries semicolon and press enter and we get one so this is the minimum value so those are some functions that you can use uh, in your SQLite uh, uh, statements and uh, you see what they can do they, you can sum you can get the maximum value you can get the minimum value and so on so see you in the next video all right so i create a new table called exercise underscore logs and i created a few fields the id which is an integer primary key auto increment so that is going to be added and incremented automatically the type of the exercise which is a text the minutes how much time it took to do that, that exercise the calories how many calories you burn doing that exercise and the heart rate so how up our heart rate did go when we did that exercise and down i inserted some data in our uh, in our exercise underscore logs uh, table now let's say that i want to get all the exercises which burned more than 50 calories to do that i'm going to type here select and and i want to have them order by the calories so I, I want to have them order uh, ascending from the from the least from the smallest uh, from the one which has who burn the smallest calories to the biggest one to do that we type here select from exercise underscore logs where calories so it, we type here where the where the close or calories greater than 50 and now we type the order by close so we type here order by calories and we type in which order ascending or descending we're gonna type ascending so from the smallest to the biggest then we put a semicolon and press enter and we get biking and uh, uh, dancing and those are the ones which burned more than 50 calories and uh, uh, next let's see how we can get all the, all the exercises who burned more than 50 calories but which uh, took less than 30 minutes in this case we need to use the end operator so i'm gonna type here again select from exercise underscore logs where calories greater than 50 now i'm going to use the end operator to combine two two conditions and uh, minutes less than 30 so now and let's put order by 
order by calories ascending. Let's put semicolon and let's press enter. And we get, of course, dancing because uh, dancing is the one which, uh, which took 50 minutes to, to, to do. And it's also the one which burn more than, than uh, 50 calories. So our uh, select uh, works. So this is how you can use the order by to order your, uh, your, uh, your uh, data. And this is how you can use the end to combine two conditions in your uh, select statement. And uh, see you in the next video.